City of Stevens Point Board of Public Works meeting, recorded October 14, 2019. Call the Board of Public Works to order. It is 637. Um, can we get a roll call, please? Sure, Mira Wiesa. Here. Mary Nebon. Here. Corey Laddick. Here. Jeremy Slowinski. Here. John Morrow. Here. Tori Jennings. Here. And Makira Zarazua. Here. Everyone is present. We have a quorum, so we will move on to our agenda. And number one is the director's report. Uh, director, anything you want to touch on? Yeah, actually a few things this uh, <clears throat> this month. Uh, just to kind of recap on our current road reconstruction projects. Everything is wrapping up, uh, generally speaking. North side reconstruction has a little bit of concrete left. Um, and then they'll come and do some restoration and do the final paving. Uh, Reserve Street is just into final restoration activities. Uh, once those are complete, then final paving will be done, so it's very near complete. Whiting Avenue is essentially complete. Uh, there's really just some punch list items, things that need to be, be done here, and I believe there's one driveway that needs to be completed, but um, in essence, it is uh, nearly finished as well. Uh, Nebel Street is kind of in the middle of things. Stuchinski is working diligently to get that project done, probably yet another week and a half or so to wrap that up. They're working on uh, base right now um, these days, so as long as the weather holds out, it shouldn't be too much longer on that one. Everything seems to be going well. Uh, TAP grant, um, the, uh, our consultant, SEH, is still reviewing the scope of work from the DOT on the evaluation and, and information that they will need to do the approval for connecting highways. Uh, we've had a few discussions with them and we would anticipate to see their proposal on that additional work here in the near future. Other than that, things are pretty much yet moving along the direction they, they were. And lastly, Business 51, I just wanted to bring up this to everybody, in case you might otherwise miss it, the director reported. Um, we are trying to resurrect this with AECOM, so we're trying to get some things together, new scope of work to see what it is and um, try to find out what it is that we'll do depending upon what potential funding sources, if any, we may have in the future, how those may impact the work that needs to be done to make sure we're not missing anything and work with them to bring together a new proposal for work to resurrect and get that work done, you know, concepts completed and 30% design, you know, finished so we know then how to move forward. Uh, with that, which I would hope to have in front of you next month. Okay, and director, we we've also applied for S, uh, applied for STP urban grants for some of that corridor as well. We have in the past, yes, and that's one of the things we want to you know look at. We're not in this current cycle, um, so if we were to otherwise proceed and start working you know with local funding or other funding that may not have the federal money requirements to it, we just want to make sure that we're working in such a fashion as to not preclude ourselves from you know getting any of those uh, those dollars. Um, a quick for example would be, uh, I don't remember the exact the dollar amount, I believe it was, was in the millions, however, you know, lost uh, for Iwasa when they had done some, in their particular case, was real estate acquisition, which didn't meet the federal requirements. So when they went to apply for those dollars, um, you know, they, they could not get them because they hadn't followed the process because they weren't thinking that process when they uh, were started with local funds. Okay. So, Alder Jennings. I just have a question about the TAP grant. Um, SEH had already caused some delays because of the historic evaluation. Um, are they meeting the targets on time that need to be met with WSDOT? They are, yes. And as far as what we're otherwise looking for, a, a let in for the construction dollars, uh, we don't see any issues related to this um, as far as, as meeting what the ultimate requirement of it is. Uh, of course, it doesn't meet their initial schedule. But I want to point out that none of these were really an SEH issue. Um, even the, the historic part was the assumption, you know, Tool had the same thing when we went through. The assumption was that it would not be, you know, be necessary. That was the DOT's direction uh, when it was later decided it needed to be, you know, whoever our engineer um, that we selected would, it would have had to come back with a change order on that. This is very much the same thing. Um, it's the first really that they're telling us for connecting highways to make some of these changes that they're gonna need to see this work. Uh, this was never part of the original scope of work um, from them um, to, to see it. Uh, I think even Dave Moret with the DOT who we've been working with this, you know, to him this wasn't something totally surprised but yet he indicated to himself and we met with him last 
um, that in his research and talking to others that this would be something we would require, which was, um, in essence, like I said, not really a surprise, but yet all the same a surprise, if that makes any sense. Okay. Any other questions for the director? I would entertain a motion to accept the director's report and place it on file. So moved. Motion by Slowinski. Second. Seconded by, we'll give it to Alder Zarazua. Uh, any further discussion? Comments from the audience? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And that is approved. Item number two is a discussion regarding alley maintenance. Um, this is put on as a request from Alder Person Nebone. Uh, we had talked about this, and we're going to be talking about it even a little bit more in our next committee. Um, we have money that is used for alley maintenance uh, in our regular streets improvement budget, uh, but I don't know that it necessarily gets the attention that people would want. Uh, we are adding, uh, as a proposal, an additional $50,000 specifically for alley improvements in the 2020 proposed capital budget, which, which we'll be talking about later this evening. Uh, so, Alder Nebone, I will give you the floor. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Director Badoon and his staff. Um, he's been very patient as I've been <clears throat> the squeaky wheel about alleys for probably a year now, over a year. Um, his staff has looked at all the alleys in the cities, rated them all. Uh, we're finally getting a feel for uh, what kind of work needs to be done. Uh, in August, we got a petition. I mean, you shouldn't have to petition the city to, <laughs> to fix your alley. Uh, I have constituents picking up gravel from the city garage to fill the potholes. So I think this is a timely discussion, uh, and I, I, I think there will be more discussions in the future. But I appreciate the fact that there's going to be a little bit of money to start some things with. It's, we could use more, but it's a good start. And uh, I appreciate the fact that your department's done such a great job looking at everything and figuring out how we should go forward from here. So. Okay. Anyone from the audience have comments? Sir? Uh, step to the lectern. Name and address for the record, please. Tim Hanley, 2849 Ellis Street. Uh, I have an alley that I'm very interested in, and I've been um, also uh, causing Mary Kneebone to be squeaky because I've been making her, I've been squeaking to her. And I do appreciate that uh, the director has noticed that, and, um, but I've also heard from the alder that um, maybe others in the city don't see that as an important issue or think alleys aren't that important. And I guess I'm here tonight to say it's important, especially when you have citizens living in these high density residential areas our alley is our primary in and out. It is really our street that we use to come and go to from our house. So I would encourage you to keep that 50,000, if not expand it. I've tried to talk to Mr. Laddick and ask him to put a zero at the end of there so we can get <laughs> things really taken care of, but uh, that wasn't successful. But um, so I just want to reiterate to the city that I think it's really important that we address these and also in moving forward, I'm concerned about this winter because we've, got, we've had some sizable potholes and I'm wondering if at least some interim maintenance could be done to fill some potholes with um, some, some cold patch or something um, before winter, um, which is very close. And um, <coughs> so, so I guess thank you for acknowledging and looking at that issue, but I'd, I'd also like to really address the mayor and the rest of the council to say it's important and um, uh, you try to get me off Mary Newbone's back. <laughs> Thank you. And I can and comment just a little bit on, on your last bit there as far as the winter coming in. And I can tell you one of the things that we're trying to do is get away from some of the more traditional you know, approaches that kind of limit us to what we can do in winter and looking at some of the, the newer products that are available too there. In fact, I've got you know, several sample bags sitting in my office right now um, for us to otherwise test out, which is essentially just for that to otherwise make more permanent patches to that so that we're not constantly being there or, or you know so you don't have to call 
all their knee bone all the time and say <laughs> we need to get it fixed again yeah. so something that will hopefully last longer so we're we're definitely working towards something that and that's not just for alleys but of course for all the public roadways and stuff to do that just to help address those sorts of issues because it's better for us as well too so we're not spending the labor time others doing that and as well as the complaints because the elders need their sleep too yes and uh, one other thing on you know some people will think you know just make all the alleys gravel and that will take our problems away well um, I drove across Jefferson a number of times, and um, while that was gravel, that crossing at Jefferson and Reserve, there were considerable potholes there, and uh, anybody who's traveled that uh, until it just got paved would also, uh, you know, gravel alleys are not the solution. So, thank, thank you. you. And I, I, all for patching. Yeah. Any other comments? <clears throat> Dwayne Danielski, 2825 Ellis Street. I just want to add a little bit to what Tim said. I would say 80 to 85 percent of the residents from the 2800 block to the 3000 block have their garages off the alley. Right now, in order to dodge the potholes, we find ourselves driving on the neighbors' lawns. And we have one by our house that's probably at least a foot, foot and a half in diameter and probably be about four inches deep. I'm afraid to let my grandson go out and play basketball because I'm afraid he's going to twist his ankle or break his ankle stepping in that hole. It's not the same as can't let him ride bicycles. I'm afraid you're going to go flying over the handlebars, handlebars after they hit one of these holes. So it would be very much appreciated if we could get our LE fixed. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Comments from the committee? Okay, I think we're good. Actually, yeah. uh, um, Director Badoon, maybe <coughs> you could explain how you use the, the PACER system to rate the condition of roads, road surfaces. Certainly. Because, uh, yeah, I don't know if not everyone can, has otherwise seen the map, but okay. I did provide it in the packet. There is a map with all the alleys with our PACER ratings. And it's available online and, at SeamusPoint.com yeah. if you want to look at it later. So, but uh, essentially the, the PACER system is the state's system. It's dictated to us, uh, DOT. Tim can probably explain this even better than I can. No, Mr. Chan? Okay. Um, as far as that, and what it is, it's just a, a, a rating system that ensures that every municipality and local unit of government is using the same system to do that. So when people are otherwise applying for AIDS and whatever else, one system, you know, community's not saying that my roads are terribly worse than some others, uh, simply because they just feel it's going to benefit them to get funding and, and for reasons like that. Uh, but what it actually is, is uh, more of a, a visual inspection of the roadway. So based upon certain distresses that are seen uh, at, on the pavement surface, um, and the amount of that distress that you might otherwise see, you just give it a value of 1 to 10. Uh, 10 would be a brand new road and 1 would be a, a failed road. So that's the numbering system to go through and it's just kind of spread out throughout there based upon those visual cues that you otherwise see. Um, for what we otherwise have is, you know, I didn't go through all the numbers, but our alleyways, you know, generally speaking, I think if we were to compare them side to side with the roads, I actually fare better than our roadways do as far as the percentage of them and how they categorize within each of those pacer ratings. So uh, overall, although we do have a few issues, just like any of our roadways uh, that we do, you know, our alleys really are, are no worse off um, or in instance to say have been neglected than our, our public road systems because really they fall in line there as one would expect to see is that you are going to get cross section between there. If we had all brand new tens means we just invested a lot of money into those alleyways. Um, and we didn't necessarily prioritize and plan our work out to say that we were going to get those course of the year like we do with any of our infrastructure. Um, it's just trying to make sure that we even out our, our expenditures to that, uh, try to stay on top of it as best we can uh, without trying to hit some really high, you know, value years there that which we can't necessarily afford to do. Okay. Thank you. Um, and as I said earlier, um, we do take it seriously. Uh, we've got a little over 300 lane miles of road in the city that we need to maintain and we obviously can't get to everything all the time. Uh, but what we are going to do is we're going to prioritize a few things, uh, hopefully. And as I said, we've uh, allocated an additional $50,000 uh, as a proposal for 2020 specifically for alley maintenance, including the additional amount that we already spend on our road improvements. Okay, then we will move on to item number three, which is uh, proposed limits of the 2020 sidewalk continuation project. We're back for discussion on this at the request of an alder. I believe it was Alder Slewinski. Yes. 
then asked us to, to put this on the agenda. And uh, I also had a, a handout from the August director's report um, to the committee members. Alder Slewinski, is there anything you want to touch on right away? I just, I, I was contacted by a, a constituent of the 8th district uh, that would uh, apparently uh, was unsuccessful to have the, that uh, alder person uh, have this placed on the agenda and I had just stated to her that I was uh, willing to get it placed on the agenda so we could discuss it and she could okay. present her, uh, her, um, I guess her case. Okay. So thank you, Director. Um, for the uh, benefit of everyone watching and listening and in attendance here, can you briefly summarize what the sidewalk continuation project entails? Uh, yes, yeah, sidewalk continuation project is something we've been doing for several years now, uh, starting first in 2018. Uh, although there's been other efforts before that, but I think finally really kind of kicked off is what it is um, in that year, uh, which is just trying to take what is otherwise a segmented you know pedestrian facility that we have throughout the city and and try to make it um, more contiguous uh, so that people don't have to walk so many you know blocks or houses to then potentially cross the street or, or walk in the street to get back on the sidewalk um, is one of its fundamental things you know beyond that it then it goes to try to find you know areas where there may be higher pedestrian you know counts such as you know potentially schools parks commercial areas there where there may be traffic coming from residential areas to try to encourage people to use the sidewalk to expand the sidewalk system um, as well as just then even moving into you know other neighborhoods where there may be even blocks of sidewalk where they don't necessarily exist but within you know the higher arching view of what we otherwise have you know it seems to otherwise identify itself you know as you know being an area where sidewalks you know might otherwise fit well within the neighborhood um, where they may connect two different parts of uh, otherwise similar neighborhood together you know to you know allow for that pedestrian traffic to to move through there without having to be into the street um, so if there's necessarily sidewalk you know adjacent to it it's not one you know particular purpose in mind for it some people have identified it's just to fill gaps others have identified it's just for schools um, and those things where those are some of the priorities we put into it you know it's really trying to build our sidewalk network into something better and more contiguous than what it is today thank you sir uh, is there anyone wishing to speak on this topic ma'am step to the lectern name and address for the record please Lois Precourt 3217 Regent Street Stevens Point I uh, ask your indulgence I'm obviously not well versed in committee meeting protocol uh, I know the Packers play and I don't want to miss it any more than you do uh, but uh, I have a 10 minute speech and uh, I know it's 10 minutes out of your lifetime that you can never get back but I'm gonna ask you to listen anyway as a matter of uh, clarification I did ask uh, my older person to place this on the agenda uh, she declined saying that uh, there would be no purpose to putting it on the agenda and that all the decisions had been made and I, I guess if that's correct if she's correct on that I would at least like to hear it from uh, more than one person and I do want to thank Alder Slowinski for honoring my request also I asked um, sent uh, both a written request and I made uh, three phone calls to try to get the maps that I'm going to talk about up on the projector and uh, I guess either I didn't ask the right person or maybe I just didn't pursue it so we don't have anything on the projectors so I'm going to ask that you look at your packets and uh, people in the audience are just going to have to listen because you don't have a frame of reference here. I, I do have a couple of extra copies. That'd be great. Uh, if I we want to have... hand these out, yeah, you uh, have they mine too, but I can wing it. I, I also need to inform you because you did ask that yes, this project was already approved. Yes. <clears throat> that doesn't mean we can't reconsider things. Thank you. Chief. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. So I, I, I wish we, I could demonstrate this a little better, but uh, if you look at your, your packet uh, of the most recent map that I saw uh, in the agenda, and then if you could look at the August map that Mayor Wiesa handed out, because I'd kind of like to talk to both of those. So as it relates to the sidewalk continu pro continuation project in the 8th District, uh, we're asking you to reconsider 
and reprioritize Summer Street between Jordan and Regent and Regent Street between St. Paul and Indiana. I don't know if everyone is with me on this now. This would be the leftmost, uh, westmost block in your map, the, the one to the west here. Can everybody see where I'm talking about? Okay, great. Um, we, there are several of us here tonight, and we hope to demonstrate our concerns and lay out our, ca our case for what we're asking. Until last week, um, we only had the map from the August director's report to refer to, so we only had a, a couple of days because we just got the updated map. Um, now we have this new map, and it differs quite a bit from the map that was in the August director's report. Um, so without question, we're, we're confused about who made the changes, how the changes got made, and more importantly, who or what determines these decisions. And, you know, I, you can kind of understand our frustration because we just don't know who to ask. Uh, certainly, the promotion of, of pedestrian and bike-friendly neighborhoods is commendable. I agree with that, and consistent with that is the sidewalk continuation project. However, when a blanket decision is with some kind of an arbitrary plan that seems arbitrary about which streets will be uh, affected, it seems agenda-oriented. And rather than a plan that considers what makes sense and what's logistically practical. So if we look at the two maps again, I live, um, for point of reference here, I live on the, on the very west side of this proposed plan on the corner of Regent and Summers. I don't know if everyone can see where that is, but it, on the corner of Regent and Summers, I'm the, I'm the furthest most house there to the north. Okay, so I'm the north of, of uh, sum, or west of Summers and just south of Regent Street there, that corner. Um, and, and I'll get back to that block in a bit. But if, if you could uh, take a closer look at the streets closer to Washington School. Everybody see Washington School? It's on the very uh, right, the south one. right of your map is Washington School. And then just north of that is, uh, is St. Paul's Methodist Church. Okay, so we have those two um, areas there that I'd kind of like to talk to, uh, talk about the specifically St. Paul Street between more Jordan and Regent. St. Paul Street between Jordan and Regent. There is a, a sidewalk there that was constructed for the new, uh, was required by the new construction in our neighborhood. So that block has half, uh, is half of a sidewalk there. And on the August map, if you're looking at it, the August map had a complete sidewalk that was planned for 2020. Now I look at the new map and I see that that area is now in, been changed from 2020 to future. Um, you know, I, I don't want to throw my neighbors under the bus because I don't think we need a sidewalk there either. But my, my question would be, why was it switched to future when half the block has a sidewalk and it's closer to St. Paul's and Washington School? So I'm, I'm curious about how that decision was made. Then if you look at Jordan, no, uh, just north of the Methodist Church, you'll see that that's a dotted line right now. It means that it's for future. In the August map, that was designated as 2020. Um, again, why was that switched to future when it's so close to Washington School and right by the church there? Um, it, it would complete that area around the school. And it, it presents the, the presumption that this was just an arbitrary decision. And I'm curious, how, why was that changed? And who changed it? Um, then if you look, um, well, what I, OK, so what I'd like to talk about is the kids, the kids walking in the streets. I, I think this is important. And I think we need some answers about this. I don't understand why the streets directly across from Washington School. So if you look down, you'll see to the right, we have Robert, Simonis, and Lorraine. Those streets are directly across from Washington School. Wilshire, a very busy street, especially when the kids are getting out of school. And those three streets have not, either in the August plan or this plan, 
been designated for sidewalks. I, I don't understand that. Now I talked to the principal at Washington School trying to gain some insight about what, 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 what's your thought about this area here where these three streets right by your school. And he said that he thought there may have been a study years ago about the number of kids walking from Washington School into that neighborhood. And perhaps at that time, it was determined that there just weren't a lot of kids walking in that neighborhood because it's an older neighborhood and not new, younger people living there. Well, I asked him if he thought that had changed, and he said yes. He thought that changed. And I, have, I walk that area, and I'm in that area when school gets out. And there are a lot of kids walking from Washington School into that neighborhood. And there's no plan for sidewalks on any of those three streets. Just wondering, why not? What, what happened there? If, if that study uh, is a standard for not including these streets in the current plan, I would think it needs to be revisited. Um, there are kids walking in the streets in that neighborhood. And Wilshire is a very, bu very busy street. So back to Regent and Summers, all the way to the west. We just don't understand why it, it has to be in the 2020 plan, or even in the plan at all, when there are these other streets and blocks half finished, and before the streets closer to the school, and where sidewalks are already started. Uh, th this just seems like we have a few dog walkers who walk a, along the tree line to the north there, that's Town of Hall and that's Ellis, Stone Const Ellis Construction there. And we have a few dog walkers who, who walk there. Well, if they put a sidewalk in, they're still gonna walk there for obvious reasons. They're gonna walk their dogs along the tree line. That's why they bring them over there. There is very little foot traffic in that area. Very little foot traffic. Now, unless the kids wanna get to Ellis Stone Construction or the liquor store, or, Partners Pub, I, it, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, they, the kids uh, were four blocks from Washington School, and the kids have no reason to walk north on Summers and west on Regent. They don't walk that way. The only residential neighborhood is west of Regent, and the kids from the school walk on Jordan to Indiana because that's the most logical and fastest route. They have no reason to walk down our streets. I'd like to talk for a minute I have to bring this up about the whole theory of sidewalks everywhere, everywhere. I'm just not sure about that premise, so I'd like you to consider that argument um, about concrete versus aesthetics and environment. I watched the video of the City Plan Commission meeting on January 2nd, 2018 with regard to driveway ordinances, and I heard Alder Dugan speak to this. Her exact words were that, quote, so much pavement is not aesthetically pleasing and not environmentally smart, unquote. Now, I know she was speaking about driveways. So I get that. But that doesn't, I mean, doesn't that mindset apply to sidewalks if they're simply not necessary? For example, is it necessary to have sidewalks on both sides of every street? No one walks there anyway, and you want them on, on both sides. I, I don't get that. And I'm going to get personal here. For me, uh, personally, like I said, I live on the corner of Regent and Summers. When I purchased the lot 15 years ago, I was hoping to retire and stay there. I'm 67, I did retire. And basically, over the years, I had what I considered a reasonable expectation that barring a large change in public need, I could enjoy my property as it was originally intended. My two neighbors here tonight, three neighbors here tonight, I think uh, had the same expectation. I know that things change. I know my circumstances have changed. And uh, maintaining sidewalks on two streets is going to be a physical and possibly a financial burden that just isn't feasible at this point in my life. And I think I have at least two neighbors who share that concern. Um, I have no idea who pays for this. Um, I've heard conflicting <coughs> reports. Why isn't someone like our older person, you know, told us, or someone from the city, who, what this is going to cost? Is, is this ours to assume? Is it the city? And the same with our, uh, as far as our landscaping and our trees. 
the city workers told me that I will most likely lose every tree in my yard except one. Now, short of hearing anything else from any, any other people, I kind of had to take their word for it. These are city workers who said, you're going to lose all these trees. Well, you won't, don't want me to be in react mode? This is, this is the only communication that, that I'm getting. And, you know, that's just, <laughs> um, here's just one of my trees. This is a spruce that my kids gave me 15 years ago. <laughs> and I'm going to lose this. And I've trimmed and nurtured my trees, and you're going to hear from other people here. We have put, put our hearts and souls into this landscaping, and it's going to be gone. For what? For concrete that goes nowhere? Makes no sense. Uh, the thought of losing my trees and digging up my manicured lawn and underground sprinkling, yeah, for the sake of this concrete is just, uh, just devastating. So whether that weighs on you as government officials who make decisions for the greater good, that, that's up to you. Um, in a way, I think that our effort to have a beautiful yard is the greater good. And I'd ask you to think about that. In summary, we're asking that the boundaries and streets included for the 2020 and future be revisited and reprioritized. As you know, or most of you should know, I publicly voiced my frustration about getting involved in this, this late in the process. As Mayor Wiesa said, it's been approved. I learned of the project from the workers marking up our, our yards, um, and I immediately tried to get up to speed. Uh, I was initially told by our older person that it wasn't a done deal, and that's why she didn't communicate it. Well, later she told me that it was a done deal, and I'm hearing it is a done deal. Uh, please understand the frustration with the, the mixed messages. It's, it's just, when your older person throws the roadblocks in front of you, it's, it's just, it's hard to, to deal with this and to speak to you guys about it. Um, I, I would like that, you know, I'd ask you to, to say that our, let us say that our, our local government considers all the circumstances that factor into these impactful decisions. Don't just plow forward for the sake of, of some pie in the sky, pat on the back agenda item. Um, fill the gaps where it's reasonable, where it's warranted. Don't look for gaps to fill just for the sake of looking for gaps. It, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, because every time you guys promote a, a bike lane or a, dig up beautiful lawns and take our established trees and promote uh, for, and take out our perennial gardens and promote things that aren't necessary, it gives the perception that there's no mindful consideration for what actually makes sense. And that's why we're here tonight. We came to describe circumstances that should matter to you and that you have the ability to reconsider. Come and look at our yards. Look at our streets. See how many people walk that. Um, I just can't believe it's too late. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just for the sake of everybody watching and listening, um, we wouldn't normally allow the, the length of presentation. That was just a little over 15 minutes. We asked to keep them short however it is very clear that this is an emotional issue um and it wasn't repeating itself uh, so i allowed that to continue thank you i just want people to know that there's not standard protocol and, and that's okay that's okay numbers. that's okay <laughs> we don't want to stifle any public comment on anything uh anyone else wishing to speak yes sir and then we'll go to you sir As a reminder, name and address for the record, please. Andy Scott, 324 Summer Street. Tonight I have three questions for you. Why does this make sense and who is paying for this? We first caught wind of this project when our neighborhood started crawling with surveyors in August and September. 
The only formal communication that came from the city was in my mailbox October 7th. The first map that we acquired from the August Public Works meeting materials, um, that, was, that was the first map. There are some significant changes that map to map was received in the mail October 7th. Because my neighbor spoke to the surveyors, we knew in advance of the addition of a sidewalk on Summers between Regent and Jordan. The explanation we received was that they found, quote, found some extra money in the budget, end quote, so added this section. Was this extra money or the result of sidewalk being removed from the 2020 plan? Is this sidewalk needed? Let's apply the trick-or-treat pedestrian traffic test. Children make their way up Summer Street between Price Street and Jordan and then turn east or west. They know they can cover a lot more houses than coming up our block for the eight doorbells they can ring. <laughs> Those of us between Jordan and Regent are often left with a lot of leftover candy. Summer Street ends at L. Stone, L Stone's construction yard. There's very little value to adding sidewalks when better alternatives exist. St. Paul leads to the Wilshire Woods apartment complex and Indiana gives access to Stur Stanley. Any students living on the other side of Stanley are bused by the school district because of the high, cap high volume of traffic on Stanley. Um, providing multiple routes to Stanley is a waste of money. Having lived on Summer Street for over 18 years, I know that school kids just don't use this section of Summer Street. Prioritization seems to be a problem on this project. It seems that if we were really concerned about safe trips to school, we would prioritize the streets closest to Washington, but we don't. Instead of putting sidewalks on the blocks east of the school where sidewalks do not exist, we're adding them four and five blocks to the northwest where they aren't needed. For, for a community that prides itself on being green, sidewalks are an illogical step. The cement industry is one of the two largest producers of carbon dioxide, creating up to 8% of the worldwide man-made emissions of this gas. Surface storm runoff is another consideration given that Regent Street only has fake drainage, and the concrete adds to the urban heat island effect. Who pays for this? I was told that we, this was being paid through the budget and that no special assessments were being issued. A neighbor was told by our alder person that the cost was going to be borne by the property owner. Which is it? Finally, when we purchased our home, one of our objectives was to no longer have public sidewalks to shovel. If we wanted to leave for the weekend, we wouldn't want to worry about snow. I made a rough estimate that the pedestrian traffic past my house will be approximately 19 feet closer than it is today, creating the feeling of living in a fishbowl. Because of the permitting process, the city has ample opportunity to make corrections before construction begins. Because of this, a purchaser of a home should have the confidence that the home they purchase is the one that they'll be able to live in. Thank you for your time and for listening. Thank you. Sir? Tom Skillman, 590 Marianne Avenue. But I'm here as the chair of trustees for St. Paul's United Methodist Church, which is 600 Wilshire Boulevard. Thank you. Uh, we have two properties that are impacted by the sidewalk continuation program. Our parsonage, which is located on the corner of St. Paul and uh, Jordan Lane towards the north. And then the section of Wilshire running down towards Washington School. We're not objecting to the site, the concept of sidewalk uh, extension. Uh, our concern, quite frankly, is financial. Uh, if that cost is borne or charged to us, uh, I'm unsure whether we can pay it. That is our concern. So, thank you. Any other members, ma'am? Then we'll get to you in the back, sir. Pam Sluguski, 301 Indiana Avenue, here in Stevens Point. I'd just like to say thank you to Lois and Andy for everything that they've said. It kind of states what's going on in our actual neighborhood. Um, I live on the corner of Regent and Indiana. My home faces Indiana next door 
to Lois, but my driveways face Regent Street. So not only in the future project, but in the project that they're talking about now, I will be affected two different ways. Not only on Regent Street, where there's very little traffic, but also on Indiana, where there is already a sidewalk going down Indiana on the actual west side. Um, what, what makes it really hard for me is we have two driveways that face Regent Street, one that goes to an extra garage and one that goes to our home. Right now, we do park our travel trailer in our extra driveway. I have been told that because that trailer's hitch will actually hit that drive or the sidewalk area, I will no longer be able to park my trailer there due to the fact that it will affect the walking of that sidewalk. So here we go, my financial status on this. Number one, that sidewalk will go through both of my driveways. Who pays for that? Do they give me um, the tearing up of my asphalt and the replacement after it's done? I don't know. Who is going to store my trailer for me now? That's number two. Number three, our tree line. I have beautiful trees in my yard. And like Lois says, at least four of them were given to me by my children when we moved in there 30 years ago, which had no landscaping at that time. One is a 50 foot, uh, I don't know, I think it's a maple ash, I'm, I'm not even really sure. But the other ones from the Boston School Forest, those will all be removed. My alder person told my husband, oh, don't worry, they do <coughs> curvature sidewalks and they can go around those. Well, I've never seen that happen before and I highly doubt that that's gonna be something where they put a squiggly sidewalk around these trees for me. So I will lose both of those, that whole line there, as well as my whole corner where all my shrubs and my flower garden reside. Okay, I understand sidewalks. But if we would have been told sooner that this was going on the agenda, this year we spent over four, almost $5,000, putting in underground sprinkler systems in our yard, which we have been wanting to do for many, many years. Well, guess what? Those are now gonna have to be removed, pulled back, have the sidewalks go in, and then be replaced. Who's gonna pay for that? I guess it's me. Okay, I pay quite a bit of taxes being on that corner. It's a double lot, it's a nice home, and it's in a property area where people wanna live. But the thing is, the only thing that walks down my street on Regent by my are the dog walkers. And I am not wanting a sidewalk on my side of the street so they can crap in my yard instead of in the trees. And that's basically my feeling on that. So not only the financial burden that is going to be put on someone, like they say, who is planning to live there all their life, my husband is retired, I am retiring November 1st, financially, it's just not feasible for a non-walking area. I would really rather see that go somewhere where the children reside, where they walk, down that area where no sidewalks are even planned yet. I mean, and as far as the trick-or-treaters go, that's great. We had 32 last year, and that was eight of them were grandchildren and other people from our family members. So I'd like to thank everyone for listening to us on this and, and taking into consideration what it's not only doing to us, but the fact that no one let us know that this was going to be on your table. Because I definitely would have waited to put in those undergrounds. It's going to affect Regent Street, and it will affect me on Indiana. So that's double duty there for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did you hear that, kids? There's an underutilized market <laughs> coming up in just a couple of weeks. <laughs> Sir, in the back. There's <coughs> not an age requirement for trick-or-treaters, is there? There's a creepy factor. Hi, it's Hans Hofmeister, uh, 3300 uh, Jordan Lane in Stevens Point. 
I just want to thank you for uh, allowing uh, us to talk about our issue here today. I uh, appreciate you listening to us. Um, I do agree with all my neighbors. I'm not going to go. I had a bunch of stuff to say here, but a lot of it's been said. Um, I do know that I've been fortunate to have two kids grow up in this town or at the, my house on Jordan Lane, you know, since the infants. And they walk to Washington School and PJs almost every single day. And I did not once feel nervous for them getting to school because they needed a sidewalk. It is just, in my opinion, we can talk about our landscaping, we can talk about trees, we can talk about all that, and if it needed to be done, it would be a non-issue, it should be done. I really believe this is not needed for safety down those roads. Um, on my way to work today, I, I just kind of paid attention to a lot of the sidewalks. And, you know, you go down Green Avenue, you go down Country Club uh, Drive, and those are high, high traffic roads without sidewalks that I see people constantly walking down. Those are where those dollars should be sent, in my opinion. Um, again, thank you for listening to us. That's thank you. All I have. Anyone else? Ma'am? Hi, Lynn Shulis, 408 London Avenue. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking, but I know I've been talking to my neighbors about this going on because I am one of those dog walkers. Um, and my beagle does love the woods on the other side of Regent Street, by the way. Um, I just wanted, I, I had a few questions and I hope we can get some answers tonight. One is, um, it feels to me, and I, I could be wrong, that there really isn't a solid methodology or master plan into what streets are chosen and at what time. Um, I, I think there are definitely some areas that on this map that are kind of like a no-brainer. Um, but I have um, several moms that um, their kids go to Bannock School in my social circle. And I mean, the last few years, I just, I hear them complain about Bannock as well. Um, and, you know, if we're going to do this, you know, let's benefit all of the city. And um, Alder Nebo and I did encourage them to reach out to you <laughs> because I know that's your district. Um, another question, are these boundaries, I know the project is approved and I agree with the overall project, but I think there's a lack of communication and understanding in terms of what's chosen versus what's not chosen and when, and you know what is considered a priority versus not. Um, so hopefully we can get more of that this evening. And you know, I understand as an elected official, you can't make everyone happy um, all the time. Um, but I see an opportunity here where I think we can put a little more thought and consideration um, into the execution of this project. That's Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, before we have Alder Dugan come up, I want to have the director see if he can answer some of those questions for us. Um, we'll, we'll try and do our best to remember all of them because there was a, a lot, but I want to make sure that we do that, um, get the questions answered so we don't forget those, um, and then we'll have the Alder person speak. Uh, first of all, I can answer your question, uh, Ms. Shulis. The, the council had uh, approved the concept of the sidewalk continuation project to fill in the gaps where areas that didn't have a continuous sidewalk, but pieces of sidewalk did. Uh, and that was the general concept, and that's citywide. I know there's some up in uh, uh, Ms. Zarazua's district, which was my district, uh, and there's several spots throughout the city. I have no idea why these happened. Well, one house in the middle of the street has sidewalks, but none of the other ones do. Uh, but the council had talked about continuing those, and that's why we call it the sidewalk continuation project. Director, you can talk about um, the logic behind where uh, and what we choose to prioritize. Uh, and, and I know the answer to some of that, but you can explain that. The, uh, the big one I think that people wanted to know is who's going to pay for the initial installation um, and a little bit about the, the concept of why. Sure. Uh, see, I'll do the, the best I otherwise can with this. The, uh, the kind of where and how we prioritize those is uh, something that we've kind of been working on. And, and these things, unfortunately, just take take time. And we've got many things otherwise going on. We are currently working on an overall sidewalk sort of master plan, you know, internally. 
it's just not done yet. We're doing the same thing with roadways. So we have a, a model that's otherwise working. We're still populating that, trying to fulfill all the, the, the attribute portions of it to make it even more robust. We work with what we have on a limited basis because it's going to take actually, you know, some time to build that, that up. Uh, in the interim, however, we do have a number of documents that otherwise help give us guidance to that. There's the countywide bike and pedestrian plan. There's also the safe routes to school plan. So in essence, starting with, with those, you know, elements there, and then also just kind of looking at, you know, our map. How can we attain some of those things that we otherwise have there? How can we otherwise then create a, a, a project? And, and by project in this case, what I otherwise mean is trying to come up with something that gives us the economies of scale such that we can bid it to get, you know, reasonable prices back that makes it attractive for bidders to want to do that so we get the best prices for everything, which I will then quickly jump into the next question and then jump back. Because ultimately, there will be special assessments. That's the way we're set up for at the moment. So property owners will pay for that. So we want to try to get them the best price possible. So we want to get the best price possible. However, we have some limitations. Of course, we could just say, well, let's just put sidewalks everywhere. The problem is that that project becomes too big. You know, it competes with other things that staff has to do in this time frame, which is get ready for road projects and other things happening next year. So we try to otherwise yet limit that to what, you know, how much we feel we can accomplish, you know, in a year. Um, you know, so even using the maps that we always have, you know, what we see on the map, you know, ideally would be, you know, nice from, you know, my perspective to think if we just create one project, we could get it all done and it, it wouldn't be an issue. That's just not really feasible. You, I mean, many of you have talked about seeing the surveyors out there. That's just one step into getting things together. Uh, to do that, um, but we, we kind of look at that and see what it is. Um, the other thing that kind of seems to be at least everybody has their, their perception, I think as closer it comes to you, the closer you start to look at those things is exactly what is a gap. Is a gap just one property? You know, could a gap actually be a block? And that's the actual aspect that we down an engineer look at it. A gap could be an entire block. If there's sidewalk here and there's sidewalk here and nothing, nothing in the middle, we want to look to fill that up. Again, as I mentioned early on about what it is, is trying to even connect neighborhoods together to bring those together. You know, we want to try to make a contiguous, you know, uh, sidewalk system there to provide the best safety for, you know, our, our pedestrians that travel there. And it, it's not a matter necessarily, you know, like the, the bike and ped plan has some of the, the latency stuff, as we're probably that. and yes, we try to utilize that, you know, as a snapshot in time and looking at that, you know, we can't just pick the, the pixels with the darkest color and start going all the way around and then, you know, take the next lightest color and spot around it, it becomes very difficult to manage that project and design that project and put it together. So we do try to keep them as contiguous as we possibly can in an area. Um, this one works out well. This one was actually um, things that have been discussed there. And, and if you're not a part of this process on a regular basis, you may miss. But this discussion for working within this area didn't necessarily have the specific boundaries of it. You know, it was brought up before we finished last year's sidewalk continuation program. So. You know, this was going, you know, way back. I'm not even sure we had even started construction on this current year's 2019, which is out on the east side, before we were starting to talk about what was going to happen here already. Um, now, as far as that, this plan otherwise is kind of, you know, moving, you know, we try to do the best we can. We have, like I said, competing things. We try to put something together. You know, in August, we came up with one plan, and we looked at it based upon what I sent staff out to try to, you know, compile for me and, and look at it. When they started bringing you know information back and we started looking at the final the the totals and what we were kind of estimating out you know ask them what can we otherwise do one of the big things that i saw within this plan when i saw it i really sat down more about it as we're gathering the information was well we had nearly accomplished something we had we had missed one element and and it was one of the things that i was hoping to accomplish and that was as someone had otherwise mentioned up is you know sidewalk both sides well if you really look at the plan and see how it changes to the second that's exactly the plan that went into the next phase of it which was getting sidewalk at least one side of each of these blocks and that's what we accomplished so those were the changes that made that's essentially the change between what was seen in august and what is being presented now is accomplishing that goal because otherwise we had missed that and and we're looking at on, on summers as being a, a block with no sidewalk on the other side um, as you can now hopefully appreciate is that you start to do that and now people are saying why my side why not their side and that's a totally different argument we do the best we can to try to put those things together but we see this from our perspective as being some gaps um, and how this otherwise is going to lay out in a more contiguous you know system of pedestrian facilities now along those lines too it says we do try to take into consideration what those impacts are to people to do that that's not necessarily what happens necessarily in your right of way, but understanding you're paying for it, 
you know, otherwise known as it, and Alder Dugan can attest to this because we came and talked about it. One of our biggest struggles is the church. They have so much frontage there. What we're looking at right now is probably an assessment of close to $20,000. And I know, talking to Alder Dugan as much as we wanted to, I know I personally struggle with that. Say, are we going to double that on them and say $40,000 kick in sidewalk at this time? Ultimately, they're going to have to pay that because sidewalk will continue to go in. But we do try to consider those things when we do that. Now, on the other side of that, there's mention of sprinkler systems and, long, and, and other things there is the one thing which is very hard for even me to try to talk to people when I get out in the field because it is emotional is that, you know, that portion within the right of way is the city's property. Um, and if you do have landscaping in there or sprinkler systems, you need to have those permitted. And if you don't, you know, we have the right to come in and just remove them at any time anyways. Um, that's an unfortunate thing, but that is the city's property to utilize in the interest of the public. Um, and so you shouldn't be putting things in there. Um, so there should be no sprinkler systems or anything. You need to have a work in the right of way permit, which can be gotten, you know, in the public works office, the engineering office downtown. So <coughs> if you do have any plans to do that, please stop in at the engineering office. You should contact someone with the, the, uh, the city before you do any work near the, the roadway, uh, at least even help to find where the right of way is. Um, so those are a few of them. I'll get a little more specific here real quick, and then I'll see what we missed on there. Uh, there was some mention about those other streets there, Lorraine, uh, Smonis, you know, Robert. And yeah, they're actually, you know, on our, our list to otherwise do. One of the things that we're looking at is there's some engineering challenges related to that and that we haven't yet been able to, you know, overcome um, to really assess the, to put the, the, the power to it. So we've been thinking about that. And that has to go along with the fact that swales were installed just a few years back. So it's something that's been a very active discussion for myself and Director Lemke as to how, you know, we can accomplish his needs as well as, you know, hopefully eventually putting in sidewalks, which is still discussions on do we only put them on one side or how do we do that? Is there other alternatives to the swales that we can put in as far as structures that will accomplish the same goals? You know, those things all need to be considered that we're, we're doing it. So in light of those conversations, as much as we want to do this, <coughs> and it may be hard to, to under, you know, to take to accept it, but this then becomes the low hanging fruit for us. And this is what helps us move this whole program forward uh, within there. It's not, and we, we try not to, you know, look at the demographics of people as far as the individual homeowners to say, if this is a young family and an older family, you know, we understand, you know, we, we, we can't necessarily look at that you know, fine tune that grain, um, you know, looking at it. So we have to pick the blocks as best fit without, you know, within there and, and put that in. Um, anyone that's been following two years ago would remember an individual that was here for like several months in a row trying to make his argument for not getting sidewalk put in. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's really the same, you know, situation, you know, here, he didn't perceive the need. And yet, I think all of us sitting at the table did. Um, and ultimately, I know I'm, you know, although I, I feel for him if he doesn't always want it, but I, I do think it was the right thing. <coughs> okay, so um, first of all, just a point of clarification. Even if you do get a permit to work or install sprinklers or plant a tree or pumpkins or whatever it is in the city right away, that does not preclude us removing those in the interest of the city. So you can be granted a permit to put something in the right of way, but when you're granted that permit, it's explained to you that if we need to move that for some reason uh, in any future project, that would be at your expense. Okay, that gets confusing because it, it can be different depending on where you are. So I'll let the director talk about that. Yeah, I mean, that others can be the best way to otherwise to do that is if you can others go on the website, there are, you know, the GIS tools there. If you look at the parcel map, it uh, helps identify what that is. You know, it's not 100% universal, but it's certainly relatively close is that once you identify and look at in front of your street to see what it is, there's going to be a dimension there which is going to identify what that width of the right of way is. Um, often, you know, they can vary quite a bit depending upon the age where they are from 30 some, or actually from 30, yes, I think it's yes. one of the narrowest ones we have, you know, 60 feet, you know, 60 or 66 feet is a common one. So if you look at that and identify from approximately the center of the road towards your property, take half of that. So if you're in a 60 foot right of way, you know, approximating from the middle of the road towards your property, assume about 30 feet is roughly where that, that is. And I want to clarify that too, because we found parcels where it's not measured necessarily from the center line. Right. Uh, so you have to be very careful with that, but the, the, the maps that are available on the city website will give you a general idea. And as the director said, generally it's used as 33 feet from the center of the road to wherever your property is. 
Uh, but that's very general. That should not be taken as a blanket comment right. because it varies widely depending on where in the city you live and what the thoughts were at the time, uh, which gets very confusing for people I can understand. Uh, but if you see telephone poles, if you see fire hydrants, you can generally assume that they are still in the right of way. I'm pretty sure that all of the properties have that. Uh, but we did find some, working with TDS, we found some telephone poles yes. that we thought were right away, but they're not. So, um, and then the curvy sidewalks? Curvy sidewalks. Oh, yes. That is actually something that, you know, we do depending upon how much it otherwise, you know, it takes out of it. Um, Sixth Avenue over by Buchel Park would be an example. Apprentice Street has some. Uh, we just did some recently on the north side construction project. So we are not in any way opposed to, and we do the best we can to try to save trees, you know, whenever possible. Uh, but it has to, of course, be within within reason um, to do that. But yeah, if we can otherwise adjust the sidewalk a little bit, sometimes we might even narrow the sidewalk a little bit in its width, um, or even a combination of the two to try to work around that so as to not um, impact the tree so much in its roots. You know, we definitely do that. Uh, more often than not, depending upon the type of tree, unfortunately, it's something more like a spruce that has, you know, very wide spreading low branches, you know, often may be impacted, you know, on those to remove them because they will otherwise overhang the, the sidewalk in its entirety, which we can't allow. Okay, thank you. And uh, because it was brought up, and I know it's a point of concern for a lot of people, when we talk about the special assessments, I'm going to turn it over to the Comptroller Treasurer to generally give people an idea of what a special assessment is and how that can be repaid. Sure. So for special assessments, that would be a charge that um, you'd get billed for it and you can either pay within 30 days or we can put it on your tax bill and we can put it on your tax bill in installments. Uh, so in general for sidewalks, typically we would finance it over a three year period. Uh, and if it's, you know, a really if it's a pretty significant expense for something like this with the sidewalk continuation, we can also finance it over a five-year period just depending on, on the amount. And then in that case, uh, basically, it would be either three installments or five installments uh, going on the annual tax bill. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are there any questions that we didn't hit other than the philosophicals? Why me? Um, Ma'am? Yes. Yes, please. I'll uh, have you up at the lectern, just because that's where the microphones will pick you up. Um, and there is a sign on there. We don't need to adjust the microphones. I know that people get a little fidgety sometimes, but. Lucy Scott, 324 Summer Street. Um, my question is, um, with those um, deferred payments, if you will, mm -hmm. is there interest on that also? Yes, there is interest for the three-year, the five-year term. Uh, the rate for 2019 is three and a half percent. We haven't set the interest rate for 2020 yet, uh, but market interest rates have gone down throughout the year. So 2020, I would expect if everything stays the same, that it'd probably be less than the current three and a half percent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, sir, you've already spoken. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it to the Alders. Alder Dugan has been waiting patiently, and I know Alder Zarazua wanted to say something earlier. It was. Okay, so, so we got that part covered. And then we'll come back to people who wish to speak a second time if you need to. Um, Alder Dugan, District 8, um, part of this conversation. Um, this sidewalks and swales in District 8 have been the biggest items of contention in the time I've been Alder. Um, Hard, hard to handle for lots of people, I think. Um, I wanted to, uh, first of all, say thank you to the mayor and thank you to uh, Mr. Badoon, who have answered most everything, all the questions, and shown the big picture, because I was going to talk about the big picture, the, the um, bicycle and pedestrian plan, the cities and the counties, as well as the Safe Routes to Schools plan. It's all a part of that. Um, but these are the tiny parts of that bigger part. If District 8 were to go by the uh, Safe Routes to School plan, we would eventually have sidewalks and, and bicycle lanes, or bicycle protection anyway, all the way out to Marianne Avenue. And that's across Green Avenue. That's out where Joel lives. Um, and then in the other areas that we already know about. But Lois uh, Precourt and I have been talking. We only live a few blocks away from each other, maybe two. Um, 
and she has, as you know, been very concerned about this and has, uh, and very emotional and has talked to you about it. I, I want to um, read a couple of the of the responses I had to her. Um, let's see. Lois, I said on December or September 3rd, it's the city's de city department's responsibility to inform the neighbors regarding the sidewalk project, but not until the project is finalized, officially approved, and a time frame is set. And that hasn't happened yet. And what I was trying to explain was that, you know, they thought, why don't we have a map? You know, why haven't we been told about this? Well, I think um, uh, Director Badoon explained, you know, these things, they weren't in, in completely in place yet for every single block. In fact, uh, Director Badoon and I hadn't even talked yet. As Alderperson, I can let constituents know that I am generally in favor of sidewalk continuation near Washington School, and I have said that. I can let people know that the project is being proposed for a 2020 budget item, and I've said that. But I have not communicated officially, for example, in a mailing, because it would be premature. One, the sidewalk map, roughly from Frontenac to Wilshire, Wilshire is still in proposal for form. Um, the plan has yet to be approved, really, that, you know, small plan, the big plan has been. A time frame and other important details have not been established. And more, most importantly, the Public Works Department should be in charge of mailing the project details to those affected because the department will have the exact information you'll want. She was wanting me to have told people ahead of time, why didn't you tell us? That was your job. Well, I didn't really know yet. Even, <coughs> even the department hadn't completed all of their um, detailed plans. And it's the department's um, responsibility all departments do that when there's a plan then you get the word out via mail as I understand since as I said the sidewalk continuation map is not finalized in our little area I was surprised to learn from Tom um, who spoke tonight and now from you that surveyors have been to your properties I'm sorry you had to deal with that surprise yourself no wonder you're upset and particularly I mean I I understand that I had quite a, a nicely developed property of my own on Summer Street until a couple of years ago when I sold it. Um, and we do seem to take ownership, you know, of the right of way when we are, con are maintaining it all the time. So I understand that, that up upset if somebody, you know, came into my area and started putting flags there and I didn't know why. Um, one more point, others who have had a public utility, swales or sidewalks, constructed in the public right-of-way have been able to avoid losing a tree, perennials, or an in-ground sprinkler, which is what Dr. Uh, Dr. Director Badoon, I keep wanting to call you doctor, <laughs> um, he spoke to too. There are ways to avoid losing a tree. Um, perennials or an in-ground sprinkler, there are ways to save those amenities, and you and Tom, I say, may be among that lucky group. Um, when I've talked with the director, uh, the director of Public Works and have got a clear picture of the immediate plans, I'll let you know what I've learned. Um, and then I say to her in another email, Lois, as you may know, older persons may place an item on, on a item on a committee agenda by sending it to the city clerk, the mayor, and those staff members involved, in this case, the director of Public Works. However, I don't see the purpose, which Lois told you about, I said, I don't see the purpose of my placing your item before the Board of Public Works. The larger decision has already been made about continuing the sidewalk uh, in, in the Washington School area. The city started continuation and gap filling in our area in 2018, skipped 2019, went to Bannock School, I think, in that area, in that time, this year, and will resume in 2020. In other words, I don't see sidewalk continuation in our neighborhood going away. If you want to be involved in determining the limitations or the refinements of the 2020 continuation project, that is, which streets will get sidewalks next year, it would make more sense to talk directly with the director, not the board. I can arrange that if you like, but please accept that your portion of region will get sidewalks at some point, if not in 2020, then in another year. Let me know if you would like to set up an appointment to meet with the Public Works Director, and then I didn't hear from Lois after that, and apparently she um, spoke with Alder Selinsky. And finally, I said to her a day later, Lois, Stevens Point has developed ways to, I was responding to things that she said to me, very emotional ones, so I said, Lois, Stevens Point has developed ways to assist citizens who are struggling with the installation of sidewalks, swales, and other projects in the public right-of-way in front of their homes, and that's what Mr. Laddick just addressed. 
the city can help those who cannot maintain, remove snow and ice uh, on the sidewalks. We actually can help people do that if they act, can't physically do that. The city has an installment plan to help citizens pay for the five by five foot concrete blocks. I think we call them stones, do we? Uh, and we pay for the labor. The citizens pay for the blocks and, and the city pays for the labor of getting them in. The city's forester will come to your home to offer advice and assistance when the time comes to install a sidewalk close to your trees or shrubs. He did that, uh, Todd, Mr. On, um, on oh, Robert and a couple of the others, uh, Lorraine and Simonis, because they had a lot of swales put in and people were upset there too. But um, the forester came and tried to do what he could to um, save uh, um, Shrub, uh, shrub, shrubs and, and hedges and so on. We had, had the same thing um, on College Avenue and Frontenac Avenue, and people had to move their perennials if they were in the public right of way. Uh, and, and, uh, but sometimes you were able to keep them there and save them. As for your irrigation system, I can connect you with others in the neighborhood who have had to reinstall that portion of the system, but it's usually only a little bit. You know, you, you take the little pipe out of the little cable out, and then you have to put it back in again, but it's not the whole system. Um, they've had to reinstall that portion of the system in the public right of way. They may have tips that will make the job easier. And people on um, some of those streets uh, east of Wilshire had to do that. Please understand that city leaders and staff have tried to make this transition tolerable for citizens. If there's more we can do to relieve the burden, I know we will seriously consider it. And I think that's true. Um, but I think, as I think some of, of you have said, I think education's the best thing. People forget that there's a public right-of-way there. And they forget that it doesn't, it belongs to the community. It doesn't belong to them, and they can't just keep all their stuff there. So I did say that to Lois at some point, too. <laughs> anyway, Thank you very much, Alder. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, one point of clarification. I, I don't know what the intention was, but the city does not shovel your sidewalk in the winter if you are unable to. We might be able to put you in contact with people who could help through our neighborhood improvement coordinator, but the city does not do that. All right, um, sir, you want to? I'll take it off. Okay, good. <coughs> um, and if there are any other questions for either the comptroller treasurer regarding funding or the director of public works regarding the proposal, um, by all means, contact him offline. Is there anyone? We talked about this for uh, just about an hour. Is there anyone on the board who wishes to make a motion? Oh, I guess, uh, you know, when this was brought to us, you know, the, the one in August, you know, I mean, it, it was basically how I was perceiving it was is that we were filling in the gaps, um, which for the most part, it, it is what that's what it was. Um, you know, now looking at this, the new one, the, the, the one that's in our packet, um, there's just a few things. Uh, most of it makes sense to me. Um, I mean, obviously, Jordan Lane, Indiana Avenue, there, those are the through streets within this uh, neighborhood. Um, but some of these, this, going up Summer Street north of Jordan Lane, uh, it's a street that pretty much goes to nowhere. I mean, it's ending at the Ellis Stone construction yard. It just, some, some of these don't make sense to me. I mean, I know the whole... The whole objective here is to we need to put sidewalks everywhere, and I remember this this uh, development here on um, Dearborn and Region. I remember that discussion, and uh, at the time, you know, the, the, I guess I'm a little embarrassed that uh, those sidewalks do not make any sense in there. Um, you're basically in an area where there's not a lot of through traffic. I, I live on a street where very little, very similar to these these blocks here on the north side of um, Jordan, and. I, I know sidewalks would not go over well in, in my area just for the fact that there's no need for them. Um, let, let's put these sidewalks where they belong. I mean, along Wilshire, that, you know, the gaps there uh, by Roberts and Simonis. Uh, I do agree with the Jordan Lane um, putting the sidewalks along both sides of that just for the fact that that's, that is a, a more heavily traveled street. Um, but up, going up Summers and going up, uh, well, St. Paul, is, it's a future. It, it doesn't make sense to me. And I know that we're trying to fill in the gaps on those up in that area already, but do we really need those? That doesn't make any that In my mind, that, that's money not well spent. Um, but I guess that's my, my thoughts. I know this has been approved. Uh, I would just, I guess, 
I don't know if I can uh, make a motion to have the uh, Public Works Department revisit uh, the northern, I guess north of Jordan Lane and uh, possibly revisit some of these uh, proposed 2020 um, sidewalks um, going in that area. Okay, let's, um, bef before you make that motion, let's ask the director um, how far along in the process, or I'm sorry, Alder, was that a motion? Yes. It was a motion, okay. Um, is there a second to that motion? I will second it for the sake of discussion. Um, Director, what I'd like to ask you to do is uh, inform us a little bit about where you are in the process, uh, what sort of reevaluation could occur, um, but I understand also that the, the continuation project is, is just that. So if it doesn't occur this year, the will of the alders uh, at the time was to continue sidewalks um, so that just because we don't do say hypothetically north of Jordan um, this year that doesn't mean next year it won't happen or the year after that it won't happen and we could be revisiting this again and then when you expect to go out to bid on this and some of the background that is required to lay these things out to make a, a bid proposal effectively what a change in this plan would do at this point in the game to put a burden on your office and the, the people who would be bidding on it? Well, ultimately, I guess it depends what the change to others is. You know, an elimination of anything is just, you know, time spent already, um, but doesn't impact us otherwise moving forward. It's more or less just incorporating, you know, newer things and that, you know, you know, would just otherwise take more time. We'd have to get out there, do the survey work, evaluate, you know, those, those things and get the engineering completed. Um, and then that was going to depend upon to the extent of which that would otherwise may happen um, but uh, removal of anything is not going to have any impact to us moving forward as far as staff time and effort okay. um, but Alder your motion was to not just remove but to reprioritize the roads within the the area yeah again I mean everything north of Jordan Lane I would I just in my my opinion that I don't care 2020 2030 I don't I, the way it's set up there, I don't think that the, there, I mean, unless obviously something changes drastically north of there, okay. it doesn't make sense to why it puts sidewalks in there when there's, I mean, there's, it's not like it's a heavily traveled road. I mean, put them where you need them. Don't just put them there because it, I'm, I'm going to feel good. Okay. It doesn't make sense. Thank you. Any other comments from the committee? We'll start with Alder Jennings and then Alder Morrow. Uh, and then once we're done with the committee, we'll bring it back out to those listening. Um, somebody mentioned that there wasn't uh, landscaping about 30 years ago, so I assume that this development is 30 to 40 years old. Is that correct? You know, I couldn't answer that for you. Is that I, don't, I don't know that anybody at this table that can answer that except maybe those who own the properties. You, you hadn't lived there the entire time. Is there, when was the subdivision developed? Alder. I need you to come to the microphone, please. So the properties that we're talking about here, specifically Alder Jennings, are you looking at those north of Jordan? Yeah, I just have a point to make related okay. to that. So let's say 40 years. Okay. Um, Great. Previous councils, previous mayors, previous um, directors of community development have made really poor decisions at times. And cities are not static. And this council and councils in future end up having to correct uh, poor decision making. So the fact that a developer was allowed to go into this area and create a development that doesn't, that is not for people, that's for cars, was bad policy. And that bad policy is now on our plate and we're having to correct it. In terms of cutting off this project north of Jordan, because apparently, um, we just want to keep it as auto-centric as possible. Director Berdoon has already said in their scope of work, they're trying to get the best bargain possible. So if that is cut out, they're not going to get the best deal on, the, on this project. And then what happens when 10 years down the road we come back to this? It's going to cost that much, that much more. Um, and any time I, um, when we say we don't, need sidewalks, we're saying we don't need people. And that's that's what it means. Okay, thank you. Alder Morrow? Uh, 
one comment that I would like uh, to make is like, if we do reprioritize this and it goes some somewhere else, many of those same residents are going to feel the same way the ones do do here. <laughs> Likely. I mean, so it's like when you reprioritize things, it's still going to be, go somewhere, <laughs> and someone else's house is going is going to be is going to be assessed. So. If there's a if there's a way to know where it's really needed, um, that would be that that would be a way to really make it better for for all. Plus, I could see for the church as well. I mean, they're they're going to have half their land in. I mean, they're going to have half their land in sidewalks on both on a two of its four sides. I mean, that's going to be twenty thirty thousand dollars just for that. Um, as a way to, I mean, uh, again, I agree with older Solowinski, like if there's some places that don't need it, um, like a road that goes to nowhere, goes to Ellis Stone, that seems to make sense. I don't sense. think they'd like to hear it that way. Oh. oh. <laughs> Shoot a funeral. Shoot a funeral home. Well, no one's, no one's walking there. <laughs> but um, it would be... I mean to try to like make it so so that I mean if if it is needed great if it's not, not, but okay. again someone else is going someone else is going to be assessed. Thank you, and we're going to turn over to Public Utilities Director Joel Lemke. He hasn't spoken yet. It's not up to me. We we want to prioritize <laughs> those who have not had an opportunity to speak yet before we go through and allow people to speak more than once. I just wanted to mention real quick that <clears throat> a lot of what's going on here is, of course, a right-of-way use matter. Right. And it's a very unpopular thing to do, as was mentioned by Dr. Badoon earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the, but, I, but I also did want to point out something, because I think it, it started when I was just coming in or just leaving Public Works or somewhere in one of my transitions in the city, is that the sidewalks north of Jordan there You'll even see on the aerial, they're bright, they're new. Those are decision made actually by th this body or a portion thereof, some some subset of the council, right, or a committee of or plan commissioner, whoever it would have been that did that. And I believe it was actually recommended by staff not to put sidewalks in there, but by requiring it, now you created the gap. So w what they're what they're doing is saying this was priority enough for you guys to require sidewalks. Now we're filling the gaps, right? And I just want to throw in there that from a stormwater perspective, I'd much prefer they weren't there in that block because we're having a real trouble with stormwater management there. So no matter how you crack this egg, we need the right of way. We need it for municipal function. That's just kind of where, where it all falls. We're going we're gonna to need to use it for something. Thank you. Yeah. Alder Dugan? Um, this, um, all of these new sidewalks that you see on the map, and there are lots of them there, north of Jordan, were part of uh, the new subdivisions that went in in the last few years, the Pritchard one, and then now Lockery one. And that's, I think, part of something that we, we um, voted to do, get a new subdivision, they have to have sidewalks. So there are lots of those. And I have to tell you, I live exactly on the corner of Regent and Dearborn on the north side. There are people walking there. Now, Ms. Precourt might not see them way down on her end, but I, with all due respect to Alder, Selinski, and Morrow, they have no clue what goes on there. I see it every day. There are lots of walkers up there. There are more and more walkers because there are more and more people living in those houses. And the, in, the, uh, in the development I'm in, which is a Bill Yutchett's Revelations um, construction project in the 80s, lots of people live right there. and. I, I live in a triplex. Behind us is a Yutchett's apartment building, which used to be the Summers, Richard's, Rich and Carolyn Summers. Lots of people come through there. There's a, and they bike and walk through there. It's kind of amazing. On the end of, on the east end of um, Regent, there is a big um, sort of a, a, a wildlife area, a wild uh, wilderness area almost. And the guy who owns it, Mr. Weir, over on Weir Drive, has um, paths going through it. So people come from that area. We've got a lot of activity there. We've got bikers. We've got lots of dog walkers. We've got um, people with children trying to teach their kids to ride on the sidewalks. 
it's a pr it's a pretty active little neighborhood there, and we can use those now. In terms of um, you know uh, a sidewalk to nowhere, that's Indiana Street. That goes directly across. Um, we might be passing Ellis, but it goes directly across into Schmeekley, and lots of us go use that to go into Schmeekley. So it, it's an important it's important for cars and it's important for people on bikes and people who are walking in Schmeekley. It's more active than it looks, Jeremy. It really is. It's more of an active area. Thank you, Alder. Can you <coughs> respond to that? And, and it, it, it sure. wasn't that I'm arguing that there's no foot traffic and bike traffic. It's there's not much car traffic. What, I mean, I, I have many, many people that walk up and down my street. We don't have many cars. That's what my argument is, is put them where they're needed. Okay, thank you. We have a motion, uh, and correct me if I am misstating this, Alder Slowinski. We have a motion to reprioritize and reallocate the money uh, for sidewalk continuation north of Jordan Lane um, into a, another area of the city. I'd Fo focus more on the Wilshire, transfer that to the Wilshire and fill in those gaps by the school. Okay. What I would, that's what my intention was. All right, so the, the motion would be to uh, remove these from the, to the sidewalks north of, 20, uh, of Jordan Lane on the 2020 continuation project and um, reprioritize the Wilshire Boulevard area. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. 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 Motion fails. <clears throat> Is there anyone else who wishes to make a motion? Okay, then we will move on to the next agenda item. Thank you all very much for your time. Um, I understand it was lengthy, but I know it's important. Item number, where are we at, four? four? four. Okay, um, I am going to, barring any consideration or, or objection from the committee, I would like to move item number six up to the next agenda item. I know there's a woman in the Thank back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, pardon? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That, that had been sitting here patiently through our lengthy discussion uh, regarding sidewalks, so I'd like to move that back there. Any objection to do moving six up? Okay, then I will move to item number six, which is on page 21 of your packets, Alders. Uh, discussion on a request for 15-minute parking along Prentice Street North and Maria Drive. In your packet, there was a letter from one of the business owners um, who has customers who could use 15-minute parking. Uh, the area is in what we have designated on Prentice Street as a bike lane. Um, the, uh, if we wanted to do something and help this person out, uh, this business owner, we could redesignate it as an urban shoulder, which would allow the use of both bicycles in the bike lane and allow for an ordinance allowing 15-minute parking in front of the business. This is something that is not new. Um, I know uh, Zest and Reserve, we had a 15 minute parking zone asked for there to, to help support the businesses. The, uh, the letter explains it a little bit, but I will um, offer the floor at this point to Renee Bollard. Uh, if you want to come to the lectern and explain your situation, ma'am. Hello, I'm Renee Bollard from Northern Bait and Tackle, 1500 Maria Drive. You know how long forever is? That's how long I've been in business here. <laughs> I've been, our bait shop um, business has been family owned here for over 64 years. We're here in business when this was not even city, it was still town hall. My grandma gave the land free for Prentice Street North. Um, all these years there was no problem, not until the bike lane markings. And I thought nothing of it when they came and they started painting them. But now the high school students and a few college kids are taking up all the parking on the west side of the street, the convent side. Um, and then the bike lanes are on the other side with no parking. Well, a few of my customers parked on the bike lanes for just a couple minutes and they're called nasty names by passerbys, really naughty names. These sweet old men do not deserve that. Um, there is no problems before this. All the motorists, bicyclists, pedestrians, and all got along fine. Very considerate of each other. Let's not make trouble where it's not necessary. Let's keep it sweet and simple. And I have noticed a drastic deduction in my business reduction. 
because of this. My customers are complaining a lot. They have big rigs, campers, trucks, trailers, boats, pontoons, and they need parking on both sides of the street because of their direction of travel. It's just too hard to turn around those big rigs easily so they go someplace else. Um, back, I went to the meeting when it was at um, the new Mid-State and North Prentice was not even included on the bike trail markings or plannings on the planning sheets that were sent out. I attended that meeting. I asked about them and they told me, don't worry about it, nothing there. Um, and then also, um, a few weeks ago, I was working outside all afternoon, patching scenes, fun. <laughs> and there was the most there ever was, that was from like 10.30 in the morning till 5.30 at night. The most there ever was was five bicyclists. I was counting them. Two of them rode on the sidewalk. Two of them were on the bike lane correctly, and one was going the wrong way in the parking lot, parking lane. Um, this is my only income, I'm a widow. And I worked hard to get my faithful customers only to be messed up by this. Please let us come to a peaceful solution, common sense solution to this problem. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak on this? Okay. Um, Director, can you explain a little bit what the process was to create this um, and what the process would be to allow this 15 minute parking. I know this is um, a, a emotional issue uh, for Ms. Vollert um, and I, I like the idea of being able to share our public utilities. Um, so go sure. ahead and explain. Um, well, I guess there's two different other things there. Are, you know, Maria Drive at the moment doesn't have any restrictions on it that I'm aware of. Um, however, it, coming forward with TAP Grant, TAP Grant will always be going through there, posed with some bike lanes. Now, North Prentice, on the other hand, uh, those are, are designated bike lanes. By statute, you can't operate within those um, areas, excluding, say, on the west side, where you can travel through that lane if you are parking, you know, using the parking. But really, that's about the only exclusion. So you can't park with, within it statutorily. But to otherwise allow for that, this, the deviation would be to remove the designation as bike lane and just create what would otherwise be a, a, an urban shoulder. It would essentially look the same, uh, would not be signed the same in the field uh, because it's urban shoulder not designated by ordinance as a, a bike lane, it would allow for parking to occur. Okay. Uh, comments? Um, I had a uh, talk to Renee about this. This is. Um, I mean, this is a business that has been there for half a century. Um, this woman is, has been there. She's been a part of our community, so as has her businesses as uh, well. Um, I, am for I am for bike lanes. I think that the bike lanes have really added a lot. Um, but I also think that an urban shoulder would help her out in regard to, like, she has been there basically forever. And when people go to a bait shop, they go there to get their worms or their meadows and they leave. I mean, no one's going to be in there for more than really 15 minutes at a time. Um, she does have park. She does have parking in the front of her, um, in the front of her shop. And I, when I went to go talk with her, um, I have a two door Jeep Wrangler and to get out of there with just my uh, car, um, is not the easiest thing because Maria is a very busy street. Um, and if you, have a, if you have a boat or a camper and you go in there, uh, it's going to be very hard, very hard for you to end up getting in and out of there. Um, going on, I think it was the northbound um, on the street there, face, facing her, I mean, on the, side of the, on the side of the business there would be very helpful, would be very helpful, and it's really a common sense thing for, for her. Um, no one's going to be there for that long of a period of time. Um, there's still going to be a bike lane there, um, and I think it would solve this problem. I mean, she did not, I mean, I mean, she is not someone who was looking for any trouble at all, and she was even very conscious to say, and she, was, she didn't want to make any trouble. She just wants her business to still, to still, to, to still go. Um, because the city has moved out, her uh, 
physicists is kind of hurt because people keep moving out further and further and further. And she has a very, she has a very, very loyal base, but for her to make this small accommodation, um, for the city to make this small accommodation for for her, at, and again, I think would just be um, would just be in the good for all and also basic common sense. Thank you. Thank you. Alder Jennings. I have a <clears throat> question and a comment, um, Director Badoon. If you, so, the urban shoulder. I'm assuming you're talking about on Prentice. If that's made an urban shoulder, are you going to move the line? If, no, if the urban shoulder. The only thing that would otherwise change, and I don't know specifically where the markings signage. are. Right. Yeah, it would be if there are pavement markings indicating as such, those would be have to be removed, as well as any signage on the side of the road for the designation for the bike lane. Otherwise, the demarcated line there, the line would remain. For the full distance of the of the bike lane, or just for. Cor Correct. It would remain. It, sorry, the whole thing would become an ur urban shoulder, or well, just it would only be that portion that we could otherwise designate. And that would be up to council, of course, to decide. You know how far I would have to assume. I don't know how many you know vehicles with trailers and stuff would be there at a time. I'm, I guess I'm just assuming that it would just be a portion of that block, maybe enough to fit two or something, which would maybe assume. 40 feet so you're talking about maybe 80 feet from the corner at which point in time I guess I would envision it and someone correct me from that you know the bike lane would then begin I'm, I'm assuming it's not going to just be the whole street but that's I don't know Alder, I think I can answer the question a little simpler perhaps um, if you designate it as an urban shoulder regardless of the length we would only be looking at allowing 15 minute parking uh, probably up until the driveway that you have on Prentice that first whatever it is 100 100 feet okay and the, but there's there's about three driveways in there aren't there okay so a certain distance the no parking would still be in effect through ordinance for the rest of the lake regardless of its designation all right and to my comment um, I did stop by and and speak with Ms. Volert on Friday and in that discussion, what isn't being addressed here is the parking by um, students, both high school students parking for free on the road, and then also university students who used to park free illegally on Kmart lot, and there was no enforcement, are now venturing further and further out into the neighborhoods. So the underlying problem is not bike lanes, the underlying problem is parking by students around the university. And this is another example of why we need permitted parking during the day. Um, if it was permitted parking along the convent side, there would not be students parking there. There wouldn't be high school students parking there. So, and as a taxpayer, I really don't want to subsidize that free parking. Um, so let's deal with the real problem and, and not point to um, to scapegoats in this case. Although, in talking with <coughs> Director Badoon earlier, as a compromise, I can envision the on Prentice, the 15 minute, as long as it doesn't remove that lane. Okay. So I am going to make a motion. Okay. And my motion will be to change the status of Prentice between Maria and Academy to an urban shoulder not change any of the striping and allow uh, a direct staff at this point. Uh, we, can, we can do the, the, no, I think we can do the ordinance too. So I'm going to motion then that we direct the city attorney to draft a motion or draft an ordinance allowing 15 minute parking um, on at least half of that block and have that ready for council to consider. So again, the motion is to change the status of that block from Maria to Academy to an urban shoulder. In the motion, it's going to say we're not changing any of the striping. Uh, as director said, if there's markings, and I don't think there is, calling it a bike lane on the road, that would have to be removed. But the striping lane would stay there. And then propose 15 minute parking on Prentice on the east east side apprentice from Maria to at least 50% of that block to Academy um, and I'll leave that to the at the discretion of the engineers to figure out where that makes sense to, to delineate that if you need to go the whole route you do the whole block but 
wherever that makes sense. I'll second. Second. Is there any need for clarification? I know it's a pretty lengthy motion, but I'm hoping sure. people get the understanding of what we're trying to achieve here. Preserve the, the lane for bicyclists to be able to share that for no more than 15 minute parking on the east side of Prentice to allow this woman to operate her business. Great. I, just, I have a comment. I sure. just don't feel comfortable that on the fly we make that kind of change when the director hasn't even had a chance to review this and look at it. It would seem like the appropriate thing to do would be to allow the director to have time to review this and then come back with changed language to be voted on in future, not voted on right now. So. Yeah. And I'll, I'll ask the director, director, because tonight is not the first time we talked about this. Um, you and I talked about this when, uh, I think it was even before I received the letter dated uh, September 20th. Do you feel you need more time to evaluate this? I, I think more time could actually you know, be beneficial okay. to fully understand what it is. Uh, one of the things that we have at our disposal these days are, are cameras that we could put out just to even monitor the intersections to see how things might fluctuate, which may even help us in identify over a period of time you know, how much parking may be necessary. And it may even then be very helpful as we try to finalize the TAP grant to see what needs to go into that. Well, so there will be no that. parking. Yeah, um, so the cameras will show no parking. To there um, to do it, uh, but well, but we'll get. A, I think we'll get a sense though for. I mean, in the amount of bike traffic, which I think is still a, an important consideration in this, you know, aspect. You know exactly. You know what where the students and stuff are parking. You know how many people otherwise are are coming. You know, uh, you know and coming around because I um, to to do that. Um, so I, I think there could be so that. I mean, it's really up to everyone here, but I, I could see some some value in that. We do have the tools to help us. You know, with that to, to gather more information to do it, which could be valuable in, in making these decisions. So again, Director, what would you be evaluating regarding changing it to an urban shoulder and allowing 15 minute parking? We're not talking about the student parking on the other side or up and down the road or any parking point, on point of Maria. Order. Point of order. What What is the point of order? Mayor, to put the director on the spot right here in public and challenge. <laughs> Alder, I've seen you do it on multiple occasions to multiple That's directors. Unbelievable. That, yeah, okay. Let's just. That he would prefer so I, I want to understand if there's value into waiting on this. You and I had talked about this. I don't know what we would be evaluating, and that's why I'm asking you. Right. So, well, I think we otherwise have it. You would just to see, the, you know, the sense of traffic coming up there, you know, whether they're parking there or not. I think they're still otherwise going to show up. We can identify what it is and, and when it is. It's otherwise happening, um, you know. Even some of the, you know, not that we capture all the directions of travel, um, you know. What about even trying to push and eliminate some of the other parking for the high school students and trying to push them back by creating 15-minute parking on the other side where parking already exists? Is that potentially yet a, a better solution? I realize trailers are hard to otherwise turn around to do it, but you already have parking on one side, and we seem to be talking about parking the other side. And I, I guess I haven't had time to really wrap my head around it to see exactly what's going on. And I said, ultimately, it's up to everybody here okay. how comfortable they are. And you just asked if I thought there would be value in kind of doing that. And the answer is yes, I, I do. Thank you. Ms. Vollard, I'd like to ask you to come up to the lectern once again. If we delay this uh, through November, I know the, the fall fishing season is under, you know, wrapping up here. And then we're going to start ice fishing soon. Um, is an additional month going to make a significant impact? Or yes, can we it is, because it's a big time fishing in the fall. You know, guys get out there, that's when the fish bite good. It's so simple. It's just like, I'm not trying to tip everything upside down and everything. It's just, they come, they park for a few minutes, get their bait, and they go. It's no problem. Mm -hmm. It's just very simple. And like your urban lane, whatever you called it, it sounds like a perfect solution. It's just like a, to me, a do it and done deal. Okay. Simple, sweet, I mean, done. Everybody's happy. I mean, because okay. what this There's issue like is, is just this one spot for right now. I agree with all their Jennings, but there's parking, I mean, there is a parking ish, issue on the other side. Um, but for this issue that's on the, that, that's on the, that's on the agenda, we're, con we're considering this, um, this urban shoulder for this, for this area. I mean, we could still, I mean, I think that Director Verdun is, is, is uh, correct to look at parking across the street and what the SPASH students are doing and so on. But for right, but for what's on the agenda right now, I mean, I don't see an issue with 
proposing the urban shoulder for this for 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 for, for this particular re quest for this particular business okay. that's been here for over 50 years. Okay. 64. So, excuse oh, me, Alder 64 years. Alder Nibon. <laughs> um, <laughs> would there be a way to make it temporary for a month to allow parking but yet give Public Works time to assess that whole area? Um, the answer, simple answer is yes. Uh, we can change anything. Uh, seriously, that's, that's how this works. Uh, we can consider it, uh, uh, implementing or rescinding anything at any time. I would caution against that um, simply because we have confusion already in regards to parking, and we're going to be talking about that in a little bit. Um, if we change it every month or every couple of months or, or we're not certain when we, when we roll it out, um, that adds to the confusion for people. We have uh, talked about the possibility of not enforcing that area. Um, that gets into a gray area too, because if we have an ordinance that we're not enforcing, why do we have the ordinance? Uh, so, uh, Chief, I don't know if you want to say anything. If you're standing there to speak, I, w I, I would like you to come up to here. Uh, I don't come understand to what you have to assess, Ms. Ms. Vollert, Please, we need to keep things orderly, um, and we have to take our turns speaking. So, Chief, you have the floor. So, um, I think there's a lot of good points being brought up. Uh, from a police department's perspective, you have a lot of young drivers there. You have, at times, a very busy intersection. Having parking on both sides, temporary or not, for small amounts of time, depending on when that's occurring, is going to create a certain amount of congestion that I do, what I would ask for is if you're going to do it potentially, do it in a manner or temporary fashion where if we recognize that we've created a bottleneck at that intersection, that we are able to effectively place the parking for southbound on Maria. I understand there needs to be parking for this business. We should, it's always existed, so uh, I think we need to take that in consideration, but uh, this shouldn't be just a uh, quick fix and all of a sudden we start getting, you know, we start getting crashes that's when we come forward or whatever so if in fact the director has some tools but i can appreciate a certain level of urgency here so um, how you put those things together but rather than creating a bottleneck i think of up at fourth how we did the curb cut uh, because that's kind of a commercial intersection there similarly i would say marie and prentice albeit there's residential that intersection is more of a commercial intersection so just food for thought from a guy going to crashes. So. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Uh, we'll go with Alder Jennings and Alder Slowinski. Um, I'm just going to say it a different way. Um, we should not be making policy on the fly, particularly when staff, the experts that we look to for guidance, are saying they need more time. This is bad policy. I will be voting no. So. Okay. Alder so, Slowinski? So was there parking on the east side of Prentice, north of Maria? In the no. past? Oh. Prior to the bike lanes, yes. yes. So from what I'm understanding is we're proposing to put this 15-minute parking in here, and we're concerned that we're putting parking in a place where it was before. So what's the concern? I guess well, that's what I'm confused. One of the concerns that I have is because, and I'm probably the only person truly privy to what it is there, but if everyone would go out there and I forget what they are, you know, the measurements of things across there for parking, everything is, you know, less than desired across there already. So, and it narrows up pretty quickly, about halfway up that block is where the issue is. So saying. now with parking on both sides, I do fear that there is going to be some congestion issues. I think it could create some con conditions for bicyclists, the few even if they are that use it, to get into a tight situation with traffic flowing through there. There is a fair amount of traffic that flows through there when they're putting in this driving. I was surprised how much traffic came through when we were trying to get it painted and sort out how the delineation was going to go because I was out there because of the restriction and right away, the road narrows up at that point. <clears throat> if we were talking on the north side of Academy, I would be talking a different story because there we have more than enough room. But the road actually narrows down considerably through there and you can see it. If you even look at the striping, you'll kind of see it almost looks like they made a mistake. And that's where the road narrows up. So that, that's my concern over what, you know, the specific area we're talking about and why I'd really like to look at it some, you know, I no, think that makes sense. looking at it in some more. I, I guess, the, okay, you know. thank you for. 
Okay, Alder Kneebone. Yeah, I think that's why I was trying to figure out a way that we could do some temporary parking signage just long enough to give our professional staff the time to figure this out the right way so we don't do something now and then create another problem that we have to come back to. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not opposed to doing something uh, to help the business, but I'd rather trust our staff to see what we should do. Um, and I think, so that's why if we could somehow allow some temporary parking there with some signage in the meantime, but well, I do like the fact that we're, we're finally understanding <laughs> that we should trust our staff, the people that we hire. Uh, there is a school of thought that actually narrowing up the road makes them safer. I've heard that. Um, but what I would like to do um, is the motion's on the floor, so we're going we're gonna to consider it. Um, one second, older person. The, um, we're we're going to consider it, but I think there's value in evaluating this further or changing the designation because we cannot allow parking based on the designation that it currently has. So short of not enforcing those rules, and that doesn't help anybody who's coming in because they'll see a, a no parking sign. We have to have those up by, by statute. Um, that doesn't help anyone who's coming in to get worms and minnows. Um, so I think it's either, it's either one or the other. Um, we can change it. And then if it doesn't work, change it back. I hate to do that, but if that's really what the evidence shows, or we allow, simply allow another month to have the director put a focus on this and bring back a proposal for next month. I know that Mr. Vol or Ms. Vollert doesn't like that idea, but I do think that that makes the most sense at this point. If our director says they need more time to evaluate it, and I'm, I, I'm sorry that we haven't had enough time to evaluate, uh, evaluate it yet, uh, but I think it's important then that we allow that time for the director to come back with a proposal for next month, even though I made the motion, and we still have to act on that. President Johnson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Melissa Johnson, District 5. I certainly understand the dilemma, um, but I do think taking the time to evaluate safety, that Prentice Street has become my favorite north-south corridor on the bicycle. Um, I can do a quick seven, eight mile ride up, up uh, Prentice and avoid Division Street, and especially now with Kmart under construction, there's, it's very hard to go north-south. It's a great north-south corridor. I love the bike lanes. I use it three or four times a week. Again, after work, I can get in five or six miles going up that way through uh, Brickyard. Um, but when you're coming south at Maria, you know, I would want to have some consideration given for that safety of, you know, where the bike is going, how, how far it has to come out into the traffic, and then prepare for the stop sign. Um, so I think taking the time to evaluate that, it's a, it's a great corridor now. So I, I would want to have it evaluated to make sure it's done safely and, um, and correct. Okay. So we don't have to redo it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments? I have a comment. Um, uh, to Director Badoon, how long do you think it would take for you to do what you need to do to see what would best be able to uh, help a help uh, it, it won't take any time really to get the camera set up. We should be able to get those out later this week. You know, I, I don't necessarily know that I have to just admit, I don't know the business well enough to know how many days might be appropriate to try to sort it out. So I would figure we'd probably want to take uh, you know video for the course of a week and then we'll need some time to just go through it. The nice thing is we can go through it as, as a higher speed. That's the vi benefit of the video. We don't do that so we can watch it at two speed, three speed. Um, as well as just try to pick times of day that we know typically there's more, you know, activity. And if Ms. Velder is willing to work with us, maybe she can even share with us her busiest times of day and we can concentrate our efforts, you know, within there just to, to make sure we are at least capturing those and looking beyond those a bit to do it. It'd probably take us a couple of weeks. Okay. And, and I don't think it could be safely evaluated in the course of a week because uh, angling is very weather dependent. Um, and I can tell you, I, I appreciate Alder um, 
uh, Johnson's, President Johnson's comments about using that as, as a, a bike area, but I know many of the anglers that pull boats, and it's just as important to them. Yeah. And we're gonna be talking about this in our capital budget here shortly. Uh, there are many things that I don't agree with or you don't agree with, but we still have to take into account all of those considerations. So someone who is pulling a boat shouldn't be penalized because they're not pulling it with a bike. Um, well, I, I, yes, that's a little bit sarcastic, but you understand what I'm saying. There are just no practical ways to pull a fishing boat on another mode of transportation. So it has to be a motor vehicle. That motor vehicle uh, has just as much right to be on our roads as skateboarders and bicyclists and pedestrians. Hopefully they're not on the road, but you, you get what I'm saying is that we share those utilities with everybody. It's not just what one wants or the other one wants. And this creates conflict. Uh, but I do think it's important that we allow the director enough time to evaluate this, and I'm going to ask that he put a priority on it so we can consider this in November at our round of meetings, even though we have to vote on the motion on the floor. So the motion on the floor uh, was to change the designation to an urban shoulder and allow 15-minute parking on an area on the east side of Prentice Street uh, at least halfway. If you are in favor of that motion, vote yes. Now. Yes. Yes. If you are opposed, vote no. 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 And 4-2, the motion fails. So now what I will do is I will make a motion that we direct Director Badoon to evaluate the situation, the area, and come back with a proposal to this body at our November committee meeting. We have a second to that. Second. Okay. Any discussion on that motion? Comments from the audience? The sooner they can get this done, the better, please. Yes. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And that is approved. Okay. Next item on the agenda is item four. We're going backwards now to item number four, which is on page seven and eight. And that is to accept the ordinance amendments in section 9.05 regarding overnight parking. Alder Dalton brought this back um, with the help of, I believe, President Johnson, so I will provide the floor to you. Alder Dalton, you have the floor. You guys are looking very fresh, like you just woke up, and I know we are ready to have a discussion about this. I'll save my comments for later, and we'll get let you guys have your time. <laughs> President Johnson, anything to add? <laughs> President Johnson, anything to add? No. Okay. Okay, Director. Uh, I think we're, that was all familiar with the proposed changes from Alder Dalton, uh, I guess this was, so I'll draw your attention to the, the memo, uh, which I think reflects, you know, staff um, at the moment. Uh, just trying to think that, you know, thinking otherwise a few years ago, as has been mentioned several times in this discussion, you know, parking, overnight parking was not allowed. You had to call and you had a few nights of that. And you know, what we've otherwise done, so there really isn't a comparison of, of what was before and what so now this is offering everybody an opportunity for that overnight parking without trying to let it, you know, in essence, run a potentially run amok uh, by charging something. Now we can see that you know there is some benefit to that. Uh, we feel that maybe if we don't necessarily like the current pricing, which is limited, you know, we can expand on that. We, you know, I think staff would otherwise feel that charging at least a nominal fee is in our best interest. So maybe something more like two dollars a night, and then as well as offering some monthly and annual, you know, reductions. Uh, with that. Uh, the other issue that I always create, uh, one of the biggest ones for myself is, you know, what would happen, you know, since this is otherwise to, you know, allow the same side parking where parking is not allowed on both sides of the street, uh, which I do think made some unnecessary challenges for staff in ensuring, you know, the, the road maintenance and stuff as far as clearing snow and, and doing and sweeping activities and, and such, um, you know, to do in a, in a timely and efficient manner. Um, since safety is one of our, you know, is our top priority, I want to make sure that we're able to do that. Okay. Comments? Chief Skiba, any comments in regards to the proposed ordinance? I know too, uh, Lieutenant Williams also reviewed this. Uh, there was just a little question about the time towards the end. Um, and so at this point, I, I th again, as long as we can make it reasonably enforceable, I would agree also even from an enforcement perspective and management, um, the alternative side parking, uh, and it may be where 
uh, Director Badoon and I work with uh, looking at certain streets uh, if it is only parking on one side that an adjacent street so let's say you can only park on odd sides on this street a street over uh, we would make sure that that parking would allow for even side so at least there's reasonable parking for overnight requests within that immediate area okay thank you and Alder Dalton I, I do remember that uh, it says between 2 30 a.m. and 6 30 a.m. Uh, there was discussion via email regarding changing that to 6 o'clock and there was no issue on your end with that changing that to 6 o'clock so um, I will make the motion Hang on, I, have a question. <laughs> I get to make a motion thank you I will make a motion that we change 6 30 to 6 a.m. is there a second to that motion sure. seconded by older person Nebo discussion on the motion Alder Jennings, any discussion on that motion? Well, I need clarification on how these two things are related. So, that's and we'll, we'll get to that. I'm just making a, a motion to change the time because that was agreed upon and it's significant enough in the ordinance where the police chief just commented on it. So we can consider that we'll, we will consider the ordinance as a whole after this as amended if this passes. I, I, I guess I just want to make sure that there's no confusion that we really have two different proposals yes. on the table. So just so that that's understood that you're looking to make that change in just one of the proposals. And basically. only the proposed ordinance change. Okay. Okay. And that's just for clarification so we mm -hmm. can get through this easier, mm -hmm. hopefully. If you're in, uh, all those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And that is approved. Okay, so back to the discussion at hand. The the, the two items before you are, uh, and Alder Dalton, correct me if I'm wrong here, your ordinance is proposing free overnight parking on opposite sides of the streets as outlined in the ordinance. City staff, our directors uh, internally have proposed what's outlined in the memo on page seven. Um, they are not necessarily mutually exclusive, um, but they are primarily two separate items that we need to talk about and if we feel comfortable take action on comments on either of these well I, I would make a comment on the the staff proposal that you, you know I think it's a good first or, or it's it's a good second step uh, we haven't really allowed a lot of overnight parking in the past uh, the time that it was allowed the city ultimately decided to um, not continue with that so i think taking a moderate step forward where we're not kind of bouncing in between the extremes of the spectrum is important and then the other thing that i would note is just that one of the things that we've really seen with the kiosks is that uh, there is a lot of price sensitivity to parking so in other words that when you change the price you change behaviors by quite a bit and an example that i would point to is you look at maria drive and you look at um, how many people parked there when it was free and then how that completely opened up when uh, when you started charging for it so that's just the only or one of the reasons why I think it makes sense to take a, a more measured approach one step at a time because you can imagine a change like Maria Drive where it went from being fully parked on both sides to having no cars parked on it that's a pretty dramatic change you could see something like that potentially depending on the area in reverse by going from a, a fairly significant fee to being completely free uh, and I, I think that it's reasonable to just allow the residents and allow the neighborhoods to sort of adapt to this change a little bit more slowly rather than having a dramatic change where no one used to park in front of my house and now it's there's people parking all over the place so anyway those are just my thoughts on and sort of why we're putting forward this proposal okay Alder Jennings um, I've been very consistent on this and I will maintain my consistency. I am not going to vote for free overnight parking until we have paid um, permitted parking during the, the day. Other concerns I have is this is the third time before us and never has this ordinance been accompanied by um, background information and research in the packet. 
and I'm concerned about the way in which it usurps and undermines staff and the work that they have done. Staff is once again replying and, and the Comptroller Treasurer is saying we can't do free, free, free parking. Um, so we have tension between an ordinance that's coming forward from within council that's working in opposition to not only staff but the what I see is the greater good of the city because we have to pay the budget and there is no such thing as free parking and that's what the data and the research show um, so I will once again be voting um, no on this I would be I just want to make clear I would be open to free overnight parking once we get paid daytime parking in place and that requires creating zones and and having this integrated system that requires some kind of parking authority or somebody with the knowledge to really bring all this together. That's what we really need. Thank you. And I'll leave it to President Johnson or Alder Dalton to supply supporting information uh, if they choose to do so at uh, Alder Jennings' request because it came forward through both of you. Anyone else at the committee level have questions or thoughts at this point? Still have plenty of time. Packer <laughs> <laughs> game's probably not even at halftime yet. My, oh, fantasy, oh, my fantasy team is so far behind that even my player tonight's not going to make a difference. <laughs> so I just soon not see the game. Um, I, I'm, I tend to want to say just make it free, but I take your point that perhaps we should slide into that. I'm, I would maybe like to see it a dollar during the week, two bucks during the weekend, something like that, make it a little less onerous for people that already pay taxes. I agree with Alder Jennings, we haven't addressed the issue with people who live in these congested neighborhoods around campus where they have small driveways and no ability to add a garage or add more space, they should be able to get some kind of a permit uh, to park a car on the street. So I, I, I'd rather see a package, uh, but I think I like the idea of alternate side parking and maybe charging a little bit of money, but not a lot for a while until people get used to it. So. Okay, I'm just gonna make another comment here because I brought it up before and I cringed, I physically cringed, I'm sorry. Uh, when, when you said that, because the biggest complaint that I get in my office about parking is, other than why are you charging me, um, is how do I know what parking is? And we just, I, I just heard that, well, let's maybe a dollar today and two dollars on Tuesday, and if it's a second Monday of the month, we'll do it. You know, and yes, that's, again, sarcastic. Let's figure out what we want to do, and if that doesn't, matter a whole lot to me what we do but not make frequent changes uh, you know one month it's this and one month it's this Alder Jenny said this is the third time we're talking about this one and it is but let's talk about it and make sure we get it right so we can sit on this and and see how it works for at least an entire season right uh, before we make additional changes and what what bothers people other than the fact that they have to pay and I agree that there is no such thing as free parking yeah. um, we have to pay for it and I'm a taxpayer uh, as much as anybody the the reason that council started charging for these overnight parking in the first place was twofold one we need to pay for roads and we shifted a lot of that burden onto the property owners but we didn't fully do that so then we put up kiosks to help those users who may not own property help pay for the roads that they use that's important to remember because I think that's great that we're sharing the burden, right? That's what we're supposed to do. But when we're confusing the people that are using it to the point where they're not sure where they can park, when, and how much it is, um, it, it, it causes more problems than it really helps. So I would encourage us, if this is not what we want to do, continue the conversations as long as we need to until we can figure something out and be certain of it for at least the better part of a year. All right, sorry, that was a little long-winded. Alder Dugan. <laughs> well, all of you know where I am, Alder Dugan, District 8. I sent you all that information, all those photos. But because people who are listening and, and watching 
you don't know that, I'll, I'll read what I sent you. Um, I actually sent you a lot of photographs of um, people parking all over their lawns and all over their properties, all over the city. I went to every district. And so I sent those photos to you, and here's what I said. Um, please forward this email with attached photographs. This is to Paul Petrowski, the city clerk to the members of the Board of Public Works and to the older persons for their consideration as they address the possibility of allowing 24-hour alternate side of, of the street parking in Stevens Point. I am convinced that allowing overnight parking on the street would go a long way to clean up parking problems on residential properties. In fact, Neighborhood Improvement Coordinator Mark Cordes says the majority of property maintenance violations he deals with involve improper parking, and parking on the street could help solve the problem. Um, associate Planner Kyle Kearns is, is also in favor of alternate side parking. Finally, let's encourage the most cooperation from residents by not require them, not requiring them to pay for overnight parking on street parking. Um, I'm in the no pay category here because I know what these places look like. I've been everywhere. There are five and six and seven vehicles out in my area, um, which has big, pretty good sized lots compared to right in town. There are a bunch of people in one place and they can't park in the driveways. They can't park on the street, so they're parking all over the property. And they've got big vehicles, a lot of them. And 54% of them live in poverty or they're just eking out a living. And we can find out that from the LIFE report and from the ALICE report, all United Way sponsored. That means that, means that many of them are all piling into a house together because they can't afford their own place. Uh, it means many work more than one job, so they don't have the time or the money to pay for on-street parking. And even 30 bucks a month, that would be something for someone who doesn't have a lot of money. Um, other cities in this region, Right now, it's Wausau and Wisconsin Rapids have chosen not to require payment for overnight alternate side of the street parking. And I would like us to try it in Stevens Point, even if we have to work up to it or down to it or whatever. Um, and then finally, I, I wanted to um, also read something that you've also seen, which is um, from our 2017 City of Stevens Point housing study prepared by MSA <coughs> Professional Services. The housing study is, uh, for anybody who wants to check, available on the city's website. In chapter 4.4 of that study, uh, it's called, What Regular Regulatory Changes Would Improve Housing Conditions? Allow Overnight Parking. One of the notable issues with older housing in the city, the study says, is excessive parking with cars parked in yards well beyond the bounds of existing drive areas. This is a multifaceted problem related to the number of people in the unit, the inadequate size of existing driveways, and that's true especially in the denser part of towns, town, and weak regulation and enforcement. We've had a heck of a lot of weak regulation and enforcement for a number of years, and thank God we've got a better enforcement situation right now. Um, it's also related to the city's prohibition on overnight parking, the study tells us which forces people to find off-street parking wherever they can. As an immediate and low-cost change that could improve this situation, we recommend that the city should allow overnight parking, and it looks like we're going to do that. To allow for snow removal, you can require alternate side parking throughout the winter months, and that's on pages 76 and 77 of the study. Thank you. Thank you. President Johnson or Alder Jennings, do you want to speak to the supporting evidence that Alder Jennings talked about? Or maybe just the reasoning behind it? So I guess, again, Melissa Johnson, District 5. When I brought up the topic of overnight parking, I don't know, three or four years ago, I had uh, brought a bunch of information from other communities, um, very specifically Wausau, Rapids, I think La Crosse, Appleton, Oshkosh, go on and on. And they allowed overnight parking without a fee. And I, 
you know, if it works in other communities, why not? I understand the need for a more regular system of daytime parking and, and um, d zones and getting a fee from people coming to our community during the day. But my constituents, the ones who have contacted me about um, parking is they need some additional parking space. Um, and they want it simple because I have four families within a block of me that don't have a computer in their house. They're fairly low income. And so if they need to park a car on a Saturday evening at six o'clock because they just had company come and visit, which actually happened, um, they ha don't have a way to, to get an overnight pass. So again, the constituents who contacted me are in support of overnight parking. They agree the other, every other side, and in fact, I had three people contact me last week. They like the every other side because then the vehicles move. Because right now, there's in one area of my district where a car has been parked in on a street for weeks, and um, PD's following up on it. I was going to say, Chief raised an eyebrow. <laughs> yeah. I saw that. Yeah, <laughs> PD's following up on it because. Um, the, the neighborhood was going to put cones and barriers on the street. And I said, no, don't do that. I think you'd get in trouble. So anyway, so I didn't bring that information along um, with this because I guess I just assumed others had seen it and I made a, a very bad assumption. So I was basing it on what was happening in other communities, communities that I visit frequently. And based on what I was hearing from my constituents, I still agree the daytime parking is absolutely something we need to take on. I like the idea of a parking authority and a more cons consistent, thorough approach. But that's, I don't have the data. Okay. Alder Dalton? When, when does the public get to speak on this? Uh, shortly. Um, yeah, there has been a lot of uh, conversations and work that have gone into looking at this, um, particularly with the chief of police. Um, unfortunately, when I've tried to contact Director Boudoun, I have been unable to uh, get a hold of him and I haven't received a response. So in lieu of that, I have also contacted PD, the PD and Public Works from the city of Eau Claire, La Crosse, and Wausau, all who responded within four hours and were gracious enough to give me time about um, and, and uh, responses to my questioning about how the system operates in their communities, which are university towns, which have rivers running through them and one-way streets, and they have snow because they live in Wisconsin as well, and how they manage that. And uh, it, was even, it was even interesting to hear from Leah of the city of Eau Claire Public Works that it's actually improved the welfare of um, the snow plows because of the schedules um, that they're able to maintain with the alternate overnight side um, parking. So um, if I, I guess I didn't record my phone calls with them, um, but I have notes from them, and I'm happy to provide that. Um, I'm sorry I didn't reach out to Treasurer Laddick to receive um, financial inputs about that. But, um, you know, I, I definitely have put some thought into this and, um, and have had multiple conversations about it. And I think reiterating the points that this is, this is an economic um, um, issue for a lot of people. And uh, I think the 2017 housing study really does get at that, um, that in our dense uh, um, urban core, that there's limited space for that, and it's, it is a financial burden. And sometimes not even just that families have multiple, you know, four ki two kids, four cars, but it's sometimes that there is people coming in and out from shift jobs and the logistics and, and coordination when you live in a duplex with somebody um, can become a burden. And so who's gonna foot that $3 bill every night? You negotiate that with your neighbor? Well, maybe that makes us better neighbors. Um, uh, also, I think one of the issues that was brought up in August was the weight of vehicles and different types of um, trailers and things, and that is addressed in a separate ordinance under Section Q, miscellaneous parking um, notices. So I think that that can be addressed there. Thank you, Alder Dalton. Uh, question for Alder Dalton? Yes. Go ahead, Alder Jennings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in these other communities that you uh, did research on, do they have paid daytime parking? Yeah. Okay. So, the, so again, capacities. I want to clarify yeah. that I'm not objecting to free overnight parking, yeah. but it has to come with daytime parking. Yes. I only have so much time, I can only put together so many parking <laughs> proposals, but <laughs> I, I, I also agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, you wish to speak? Uh, 
Nancy Roppe, 925 Smith Street, District 1. I remain opposed to this ill-conceived and misguided ordinance amendment. At the August 12th meeting, City Clerk Petrusky told you overnight parking created a nightmare when it was allowed in the past. Assistant Chief Zenner implored, implored you to be careful before, before plunging ahead at taking yet another crack at getting this wrong. Doing a favor for the few at the expense of the many is a colossal mistake. Yet here we are, and evidently you're hell bent on going forward while completely discounting the firsthand valid misgivings <coughs> of police professionals. You stand to face a barrage of complaints from your constituents when it goes bad, and it will. There was a comment at the August 12th meeting that I was the only person who spoke in opposition to this proposal. <coughs> It was 11 p.m. when that item was finally discussed. I'm not surprised I was the only person there because other people obviously had to leave. It's not fair to dismiss my concerns because I was the lone individual who managed to stick it out until the end of that meeting or to chalk it up as a lack of attendance tonight <laughs> when the Packers are on Monday night football. You don't get, would you please not laugh? Thank you. You don't, get, you don't get to enact this proposal without considering the headaches it will create in my neighborhood. On my street, there is not, there's only parking on one side of the street, so there's no switching back and forth. It's always gonna be in front of my house. It is the full-time owner-occupied residences that stabilize the blighted neighborhoods like mine. We have enough to contend with. In the last two weeks, just down the block from my home, a woman was attacked by an unknown assailant while walking to her car. Just steps from my front door, in broad daylight, a man wielding a knife was arrested after threatening people walking through the area. I'd be happy to show you the pictures I took of his arrest. Just two days ago, I removed yet another discarded alcohol container from the boulevard in front of my home. Thankfully, this spent vo vodka bottle wasn't smashed in the street like countless others I picked up or swept up over the years. No, you don't get to turn away and hide your face when confronted because you don't want to hear about the problems your overnight parking solution is going to cause for me and my neighbors when absentee slumlords force their tenants to park in the street. There are far too many unanswered questions which I doubt you have considered or even thought of. But here's my list. On August 12th, it was discussed that the ordinance would not allow parking on streets where parking is currently allowed only on one side of the street. But this hasn't been included in the ordinance amendment. The memo from the Public Works Department that you have in front of you clearly states there is no opportunity to perform snow clearance or street sw sweeping when vehicles are parked in the same spot every night. So why does the ordinance allow parking, overnight parking on these streets? Since the street sweeper won't be able to properly clean the streets where these cars are parked, Whose responsibility is it to clear the streets of the refuse, leaves, etc., that will inevitably collect there? Who will enforce this ad hoc street cleaning? Where in the ordinance does it state this overnight parking proposal applies only to passenger vehicles? Where did it prohibit semis, motorhomes, tent campers, boats, trailers, shipping containers? Have you taken into account the negative economic impact to local storage companies who will lose business when motorhome owners realize it's cheaper to park all year on the street instead of paying for a storage company? If I get an overnight parking permit and lose my housing, can I live out of my car? Can my car, motorhome, or tent camper become my residence by virtue of the fact I have an overnight parking permit? We've been told this change is being proposed at least in part to accommodate residents who do not have space to park cars because being used by their teenage children. How will routine and snow emergency snow plowing be accomplished if these residents have no place to park these cars except in the street? Where will they be moved during a snow emergency? The same question applies to and needs to be answered for vehicles at student rental properties that have nowhere else to park. 
If an overnight permitted vehicle ends up being towed during a snow emergency and towing charges are assessed to the vehicle owner or his or her parent, are these charges appealable? And if so, when waived, do they ultimately become the responsibility of the taxpayers? Who is ultimately responsible for resolving any overnight parking abuses or issues? Who can a resident call, contact, and work with when, not if, these issues arise? Will such issues be resolved to the satisfaction of the complainant? When cars parked overnight are vandalized, who is responsible for cleaning up and or removing any broken glass or other debris that remains in the street after a break-in? Who will enforce this debris removal? If an overnight permitted parked car is damaged by a city hired tow truck, city owned street sweeper, or other city owned vehicle, can the vehicle owner file a claim against the city for the damages? Or does the vehicle owner accept any and all responsibility for any potential damage by virtue of making the choice to park in the street overnight? Will the overnight parking permit include a whole harmless clause to indemnify the city against any damages that might occur to an overnight permitted park car? Is an overnight parking permit applicant required to show proof of insurance? <coughs> if an overnight permitted park car is ultimately deemed abandoned, what is the procedure to vacate the overnight parking permit and get the abandoned vehicle removed? Is the overnight parking permit vehicle specific? In other words, is a permit assigned to a specific vehicle, passenger car only, or is it transferable? What happens when a permit holder replaces an old car with a new vehicle mid-year? May a permit be used to park Johnny's car one night, Susie's car the next, mommy or daddy's car or a visitor's car as needed? Or would the family need to purchase a separate and distinct permit assigned to each such vehicle in the household? Is an overnight parking permit residence specific? Only one per residence? If not, any student rental property could pack 12 people in the residence, only have parking for eight cars, and force four people onto the street. If Johnny has a permit for his parents' residence, but decides to stay overnight or for an extended period of time at a friend's house, can he use his permit to park at the friend's residence? If Johnny gets a permit for overnight parking at his parents' residence and then decides to permanently move out to another location in the city, taking his vehicle with him, does the permit go with the vehicle or is it tied to the original residence where it was intended to be parked? If Johnny can take his overnight parking permit with him when he moves, what is his responsibility to change his address to his, his permit to his new address? If Johnny fails to notify the city of his new address and receives a ticket for overnight parking where it was not allowed, will this ticket ultimately be waived upon request because he had an annual overnight parking permit? Will an overnight permitted vehicle be required to display an easily visible parking permit sticker of some kind so residents in a given neighborhood like mine can distinguish uh, between legally parked overnight permitted vehicles versus illegally parked cars? Currently, there is no such system for the public to have access to the database that contains this information, and I confirmed that with Lieutenant Williams. Will the easily visible parking permit sticker display an expiration date? We deserve answers, and if you can't, or won't provide specific answers to these questions, you have no business moving forward with this proposal. You don't get to vote this in and count it as an accomplishment while turning a blind eye to the inherent detrimental aspects I guarantee you will occur in my neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ma'am, I assume that since you had those typed out that you have those questions in uh, digital format? I was answering them in my head, and I probably missed a few because it was going rather quick. There wasn't time to answer any of them. But if you, if you want to send those to me, I can give you answers to at least 90% of those questions, um, just listening to them off the top of my head. But I want your, your questions answered. So if you send those to me tomorrow, uh, mwiz at stevenspoint.com, but I'm guessing you know the, uh, the email address. Send those to me, and I'll get you those answers on all of your questions. Any other comments? 
Okay. We don't have to take action. My recommendation would be to not take action on this. I like the idea of having the um, odd and even overnight parking at no charge or at the very least a nominal charge, uh, but that's something for the, the body to consider. I uh, agree with Alder Jennings that we should do this at once, all at once, so we don't have makeshift, uh, let's reconsider this and, and, and those sorts of things that adds confusion. Uh, if, if everybody's okay with the ordinance as presented, I would uh, be willing to entertain a motion to postpone action on the ordinance until such time as we get some daytime parking things figured out, if that was appropriate. You don't even need a motion to that effect if you choose not to. Um, basically, the world is your oyster when it comes to parking. We can do what, whatever this body chooses to do. Alder Zarazua. Um, I got my point of view and what I've heard from many of my constituents that I've talked to is that we're ready to ha allow overnight parking and not have a fee. Yeah. Um, we live, I'm in an older part of town. Um, a lot of homes have reasons why they can't add on if they need additional parking. Um, I know the first big meeting we had, my neighbor across the street um, talked about why they, they can no longer park in their driveway since Sixth Avenue was redone. Um, so just knowing it's also adding more concrete when we don't need to, we already have all of these streets here for parking on. Um, I also feel, you know, Dalton has brought this for Alder Dalton has brought this forward, you know, three months in a row. Um, and a lot of us are ready to see this passed. Okay. I actually have a, a couple of questions. The only time on street parking is not authorized is for three and a half hours from 2.30 in the morning to 6, since we ch or 6.30, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're really only talking about a three and a half hour window where parking is not permitted. So if I'm staying at somebody's house, I can stay there till 2.29 and get in my car and leave. So m most of the time there's a car there. What's the going rate for an hour on the kiosk? Is it 50 cents? 75 cents. 75. So we're looking at what, three and a half hours at 75 cents. So uh, $2 is a pretty good deal mm -hmm. for three and a half hours worth of parking uh, on the street. And when I lived in Madison in an apartment, we didn't have off street parking. So I had to park on the street and I appreciated the fact that I could park on the street without having to pay <laughs> night after night and just move my car, except on Badger football Saturdays, because I was close enough to the stadium that if you left, you wouldn't be able to get a parking space again until the game was long done. So um, we're really just talking about a three and a half hour window here um, that we're trying to change. So anyway, that's, that's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, one oh, thing, uh, it, it, treasurer. It, as far as, I guess, refining the, the ordinance that's before us, I know Director Badoon mentioned the concern um, about number two in the ordinance where it talks about where parking is normally permitted only on one side of the street. Vehicles may park overnight on both odd and even numbered days except during snow emergencies. And I think that was the one where there was the concern about vehicles being left standing. I believe that's still in the the ordinance has presented. So I think maybe just to kind of keep the ball rolling here, uh, I'd like to make a motion to remove that provision just since it is a concern for public works. So my motion is just to strike that uh, where parking is normally permitted under number two, uh, where parking is normally permitted only on one side of the street, vehicles may park overnight on both odd and even numbered days, okay. except during snow emergencies. Is there a second to that motion? I tend to, Sarah Zuo is seconding. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to agree with the Comptroller Treasurer that um, from what I hear on the streets guys, moving those vehicles mm -hmm. is important. If there's currently no parking on that side of the street, um, you either allow parking on that side of the street or you don't. Um, there, there are more than enough opportunities on side streets if you need that overnight parking. In some cases, and I, I haven't looked at every street in the city, but in some cases, it may be a block walk. That's not going to kill us, probably. 
Any discussion on the motion to amend the proposed ordinance? Yeah. Any comments from the audience on the motion to amend the proposed ordinance? So if I, again, Nancy Robbie, 925 Smith Street, if I understand your motion mm -hmm. on Smith Street, where there is no parking on one side of the street, mm -hmm. there would not be overnight parking on that street at all. Uh, no. Every, every other day. Right. I, I, every other day. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, so odd-numbered sides on odd-numbered days, even-numbered sides on even-numbered days. In mm -hmm. uh, Smith, there's no parking on the west side. Correct. So those are the, uh, help me out here, odd-numbered <coughs> sides, even-numbered sides. So on even-numbered days, there would be no parking on Smith Street. On odd number days, they would be able to park on the east side of Smith Street. Okay, so if you get an overnight parking permit and you live on Smith We're Street. We're not talking about the permits. This is just the ordinance. Two separate proposals, as we mentioned earlier. The permit is the recommendation of staff. The ordinance proposal was brought forward by Alder Jennings and President Johnson. I'm sorry, no, Alder that. Dalton and President Johnson. I apologize. Okay. Two separate items. We have not considered either of them yet. We're just making a motion to change the ordinance as proposed. Okay. I still think that's going to cause massive confusion for people to know that on certain streets you can only park on that side on an even numbered day. And I don't doubt that. Uh, even though there's going to be no parking signs there, uh, people have a tendency to park there as you've taken pictures out your window. <laughs> Any discussion again on the motion at hand? Okay, the motion is to strike the sentence um, referring to allowing parking on the same side of the street if there's no parking on the other side, removing that line. If uh, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment passes. Now, we still have discussion opportunities or action if you'd like, uh, but again, I would, I would urge caution so we don't be flip flop or we're not flip flopping around which is one of the things that assistant chief Zenner had talked about is changing it here and changing it there people get confused sometimes maybe the enforcement people even get confused as to where things are are there any wishes from anyone on this committee to make a motion yes yes I alder zarazua i would move to approve the ordinance that we have in front of us with ordinance the, as adopted or as amended as amended so the ordinance proposal is your motion you're moving to approve the ordinance as we amended it yes is there a second to that for lack of a second the motion fails is there any other motions if not i'm going to encourage citizens alders and staff to continue those discussions um, and when we can come up with a plan that that seems to work as we know that it's not going to fix everybody uh, but let, let's make our changes uh, one at a time okay uh, let's see next item on the agenda is uh, that one's a lengthy one as well to accept the ordinance amendments in section 9.05 regarding parking uh, this believe it or not um, there are hundreds of ordinances um, relating to parking and as we delve into the parking discussions further we're finding more and more things that don't necessarily match. We're finding areas that have signs but no ordinance, ordinances but no signs, and the director has been working on uh, cleaning those up as to what makes sense. Director, you want to touch on your memo? Uh, sure. Uh, the majority of these are, again, just cleaning up what we otherwise have. Uh, most of them that were otherwise downtown were pointed out to us by Lieutenant Williams that there was otherwise signage there. However, when we delved into it, there wasn't an ordinance to support the signs that were there. So. Uh, we created the ordinance uh, to do that uh, in that time frame too though we did update a few of them because some of them had you know different time constraints than what we're trying to create in our uniformity uh, one of those aspects is just the enforcement and you know the cso's are somewhat confused and the people using it must be confused too if i time constraint i can park from eight restricted eight to four here and it's seven to six there and it's seven to five over here and it's whatever in different places so we're trying to re reduce the amount of differences we have there keep things a little bit cleaner, help people, you know, figure out when they can park, uh, and of course when they're, they're going to be enforced. Um, to the exception of that, as I pointed out in the memo, there are a couple of new things in here, um, and the, the 
Uh, one specific one is the creation of a drop-off area on Fremont for the university's uh, daycare. Um, they recently lost access to the parking lot behind them. We had given them some room on High Street already. We'd actually like to just remove that High Street stuff and give them some room on Fremont, which would be closer and more convenient for them to the doors that people enter and exit through the job to pick up their children. Okay. Any questions for the director? Alder Jennings? Comments? Can I make a move to approve? Okay. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second by Alder Person Kneebone. Discussion? Comments from the audience? Hearing none, although, oh, sorry. I was just going to say this really helps as we go forward to try to come up with a good solution to parking is to have some of these little fussy things taken care of ahead of time. So, and, and it Thank is. You. Um, we're, we're not Director. done yet. <laughs> it, it's great. And we, we, uh, we owe a lot of this to Lindsay, too, um, who overlaid a lot of this on GIS, giving us a visual reference rather than just reading through the lines of ordinance that probably only Logan enjoys. Um, but, it, but it's important to note, too, that over the years, things happen. Councils before us, staff before us, as Alder Jennings said, mayors before us made things based on what they thought was right at that time. Um, some of this was done through handshake or, or arm's length transactions and, and promises. Um, some of it was put on the books and not signed correctly because of one reason or another. Uh, part of our job is to go through those ordinances and the zoning code and everything else uh, to see does it does this apply anymore? Is this accurate or do we need to clean things up? Um, and this is just a continuation of that. So I, I think it's good uh, and it's, it's important to note that, that the GIS work was pretty critical in some of this, uh, trying to figure it out, along with the signs, which is also a GIS overlay. Okay, if you are in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That is approved. Item number seven is to accept the proposal from Strand and Associates for design assistance for the 2020 reconstruction project in the amount not to exceed $175,000. Director. Thank you. Uh, what we always have in the packet is a proposal from Strand Associates uh, for the assistance for our reconstruction project, which is going to be the area around the university. Do that. Uh, this is something that we just otherwise have. You know, this is uh, a little bit more than we can otherwise, you know, bite off at the moment. We've got plenty of other work to keep staff busy clearly throughout the, the winter. So, uh, Director Lemke and I have reviewed this, and we feel that they have. There's maybe a few minor tweaks to the language that we others have there to make sure we're clarified. But uh, in essence, they have the work identified as what we would otherwise see. Uh, we feel that their price is is very much in line to give an idea. This is a. a there's some significant challenges to this one, more so even than on the north side, uh, as well as it's a, it's a bigger project. Um, but that one was roughly, I think it was 137, around 40, somewhere in there for Grimmer last year, which I thought was a, a fair price. Uh, so this one, even though it's a little bit more, I think given the scope of the work here is, is probably even a, a better deal for the city in that respect uh, to get there. Uh, Strand would be a little bit newer, um, I think, for us as far as th this type of work that they've done, uh, but very reputable in, in what they do. I think one of the things with some of the challenges there, we just felt that they had some of the horsepower we were looking for and the ability to come through on some of the things that may be a smaller, nothing against Grimmer, they did great work for us on there, uh, but I know they've got other things going on that can otherwise, you know, tackle this to make sure we can, you know, we can get over those challenges as well as meet our marks for uh, uh, getting this out to bid first thing in the, the spring. Okay. Uh, Alder Smolinski. So do, was this the only reply we we received? Well, this is something that you just started otherwise talking um, through this. Um, you know, no quotes otherwise sent out. And I started talking to otherwise various firms on, you know, what are their, their level of interest, their availability to do things. Um, just had asked several of them others to visit to go through this. Uh, Strand was by far the most receptive to, to those things. You know, they were the only ones really to come up and, and, and take a, uh, a look to the, to the depth that they otherwise did, um, as well as just trying to otherwise keep uh, – you know, someone else's book. So, um, really, it was kind of otherwise led, probably more <coughs> yourself, even than, than um, uh, Director Lemke, to you know get this through them. You know, essentially, it was getting their proposal to see where they are and telling them if they weren't in the ballpark, you know, we were going to look elsewhere. And I think they actually gave us a very, very favorable price. I'm um, really for it. So I just as soon move forward with with this and keep them um, get them uh, helping us. Okay. Director Lemke, any additional comments? Yeah, I, I think where you might have been going to is something related to proposals. And one thing I'd just point out is that we've been through several 
big projects in the past that resulted in a lot of RFPs, a lot of requests for proposals from reputable engineering firms, and somebody always comes in second, right? And it's always a matter of evaluating them and really wanting to develop a relationship there to know how that works. And so Strand has been graded very highly in RFPs in the past, to your point. Um, we've evaluated their work. We've worked with them in, in years past under the treatment plan. So we do have some, some experience there, um, past and current, and they've been very, very highly graded in our RFPs in the not too distant past. Thank you. Any other discussion or a motion? Alder Nibon? Uh I would move to accept the proposal from Strand and Associates for design assistance for the 2020 reconstruction pro project in the amount of $175,000. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Alder Person Morrow. Further discussion? Comments from the audience? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That is approved. Our agenda is exhausted, and we are adjourned at 9.23.